Welcome, mountain bikers. Thanks for tuning in to the Inside Line. You guys are stoked about Croatia, the first World Cup downhill of the season? It's right around the corner. We actually have a detailed photo course walk from Croatia on VitalMTB.com right now. So if you haven't seen those photos yet, check them out and be glad you're not a wheel or a tire. Those rocks look disgusting. We're pumped on today's guest because speaking of World Cup downhill, we have one of America's greatest downhillers in the form of Lee Donovan on the show. It was an honor to meet up with Lee. I'd, we'd been introduced before. I think we might have like shaken hands and stuff, but I'd never really spent any time around her. And as you'll see in the podcast, some 20 years ago, I was kind of stalking her and Cully on the sidelines of the dual slalom track at the Norma National in Breckenridge. So it's pretty cool to see where mountain biking brings us. And Lee was awesome. Super honest, super open. And now I'm even a bigger fan than I was before. So I hope you enjoy the show. And here's to World Cup downhill racing. Yeah. This Vital MTB Inside Line podcast is brought to you by Jensen USA. Shop for great deals and get professional advice on your favorite bikes, components, and riding gear. Over 2 million happy cyclists served since 1994. Visit JensenUSA.com slash the Inside Line podcast and use code InsideLine for 10% off qualifying items. Maxxis Tires, where the rubber meets the dirt, Maxxis makes no compromise tires for any rider, any trail, any time. Should we just get into it then? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm actually recording now. Okay, no problem. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have to be like this because my voice doesn't carry that well through it. But So I can kind of check levels and stuff. Yes. It's Friday the 13th. Are you superstitious or anything like that? I um, am not at all superstitious. Nothing at all? I'm not at all. If anything, I look forward to these days because I think they're the days that people are more careful and more cautious. So I figure they're the safest days to be out on the road driving <laughs> or, you know, anywhere to go flying because people are so superstitious. I feel like it's the safest day in, uh, of the year. <laughs> okay, cool. Did you ever have any like... OCD or repetitive routines or anything oh, like yes. that to get going? Oh, yes. I'm super OCD. Okay. Like we, everything we in my that, life. But... Yeah, I'm pretty – I am pr I, I try to not be so gnarly, but I'm pretty gnarly. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right. Let, let's just go into that. Tell – what are you okay. super gnarly about with some OCD stuff? Um, right? Well, like I – in my shower, I hate when the labels aren't like perfectly balanced um, on the – Ooh, like shit. that? That <laughs> serious. <laughs> Like my soap and my conditioner, and I like I like everything like perfect. So you're like twisting stuff, like yeah. you're arranging the labels like a yes. store shelf. Yes, really? and I'm kind of like that in the fridge. I'm not like my mother-in-law. She's to the next level, which makes me feel <laughs> at least like I'm not quite at that level. Yeah. Um, but when I'm around my mother-in-law, I notice it more. I go, oh my god, I'm just like that. It's so crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So okay. yes, I'm a little. <laughs> a little particular that's awesome all right well, we can go into some more <clears throat> ocd oh. stories but i'll do a little formal intro like okay. i always do and kind of told you a little bit about it already but yeah get rolling okay Knock this out so. awesome howdy vital mt beers i'm sean spomer and this is the inside line podcast privileged to have one of downhilling's most successful racers of all time wow lee donovan especially on the american front Thanks for being here. Glad you could be on. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, no problem. So, you know, like I told you earlier, like I found myself pretty stoked about where mountain biking is taking me because I remember seeing you for the first time. The first like mountain bike race I really ever went to was Breckenridge in 1998. And I saw you and I think Cully was with you. You were pushing up the dual slalom. And I was just kind of like some trackside stalker. I'm like, oh my God, it's Lee Donovan. <laughs> so that was 1998. And then... The Vale at World Champs a couple of years later in 2001 when I was filming a little bit and there was the whole 9-11 thing and the American team was kind of together at the opening ceremonies and stuff. I was just sort of in the background watching you all interact and seeing how special that was. And now 16 years later in your house interviewing you right now. I so it's just it. really cool to see where mountain biking takes I just I so. think that mountain biking... It's the same for me too. It's just the the positions that I feel like I've been in over the last, gosh, I guess I've been doing this since 92. So 26 years, <laughs> long yeah. time. 
you know, uh, like just a few years ago when Brandon Semenuk won the Red Bull Rampage, you know, we were having dinner with him that night and I'm sitting next to him chatting to him and I'm a fan totally. I think he's amazing. And I just thought that is so rad. Like I'm sitting here with the winner of Red Bull Rampage. So I think no matter what level of athlete you are, you're still a fan of other people. And Mm -hmm. just like I told you, I love your podcast. And it's been, you know, weird having you talking in my house. And I'm like, (laughs) I feel like, you know, I have the podcast going, but I'm actually on the podcast this time. Nice. That that's cool. Considering like where, where you've been, but then to be, a fan of Seminuk. Yeah. That. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I don't and think I'm a like... fan of a lot of writers, you know, even when I retired in 2001, um, I was a fan of, you know, writers, you know, like April lawyer and Taylor Muxlow and David Clausen van Norshot mm. and, you know, American writers and Taylor being the Aussie writers. I just, I really loved and I wanted to champion and, um, and so I, I've always, even when I was racing, you know, I was a fan of so many writers. Hmm, so okay. I just, I think that some people are just both can be racers and fans. Like I heard you talking to Rob Warner on the last uh, podcast and yeah. how he's like really loving what he does. Cause he's really a fan. Yeah. And, um, and I feel the same way. I feel like I maybe even have been more of a fan the whole time than I've actually been a racer. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah there's. <clears throat> Got some questions down the way that'll kind of get into that, that okay. whole rivalry thing. And like, uh-huh. do you ever have anyone you want to beat? But Oh, yeah. But, it's, <laughs> but we'll get yeah, there. Yeah, we'll touch that yeah. for sure. That's interesting. Um, again, thank you for being on. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. So, I'm glad with how the timing worked out because Croatia, the first World Cup of the year, is a couple days away. And I think as kind of Warner and I talked about, the, the women's racing this year seems like it's going to be pretty off the charts. And so having you with your pedigree, are you following what's going on? Like, are you thinking about, you know, what the women are doing downhilling now and all that? I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not, I'm not like bros with any of the chicks out there that race, but I'm fans and, um, you know, just watching, um, uh, just watching the Crankworks New Zealand event and, uh, Tawny just rocked it, right? Like she just rode so beautifully, so confident and really pretty crappy weather Mm -hmm. conditions. And I mean, smoke those chicks. Like she was unreal. And to watch somebody have their game on that early, it was impressive. And, you know, like I love Miranda Miller. I think Mm -hmm. she's awesome. Um, I feel fortunate that I've had a chance to spend, you know, a little bit of time with her. And I'm going up to Squamish this summer. And she said maybe we can ride together. So that was kind (laughs) of an honor. Nice. Um, But, yeah, I think that, you know, like seeing what's going to happen with Rachel. You know, I follow Rachel and I watch the Atherton Diaries. And um, I just think that the women's racing, you know, when Rachel dominated, it was boring a little bit, you know. It's just like during my day when Anne Caroline rolled up and everybody's like, who's getting second? It was the same thing. And, um, you know, but uh, now you've got some fight in some of the other riders. You know, sometimes, you know, sadly for Rachel, she had a huge setback, but maybe for the racing side of it, it'll be exciting. And, you know, now she's kind of an underdog. So good yeah. for her, right? Like yeah. now she's going to have more people championing her. Do you, who are you picking at Croatia for the women? Oh gosh, it's real rocky and real technical. I saw the course on, uh, we follow that Valley hole. I think, how do you say her yeah. name? Mm-hmm. She's adorable. Um, junior racer. And, uh, we were watching her there. She was getting like eight trillion flats. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. It was terrible. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't pick a rider, but you know, I mean, Tawny looked amazing, but I don't, you know, I don't know what all the other girls are doing. Okay. So, um, I wouldn't make a pick on that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <clears throat> Let's kind of, uh, we'll sort of jump back and give us the dime tour of, of your history. Okay. Like where you came from. I know you've got the big BMX background, mountain bike background, but how did you get into bikes? Like where did it all come from? Okay. So, um, I actually was born about a mile as a crow flies from this house. Wow. Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're in Santa Ana, California. I so. live in, I was born in orange and, um, my parents still live in the same house. They bought two months before I was born. Hmm. Um, we're not, my parents aren't big on change, (laughs) clearly. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, I always was, I was always that kind of kid that wanted to try something new. 
and uh, but always forced to do the same thing. Okay. And so when I was 11, my cousin had just gotten her driver's license, and my grandparents lived over, both of my grandparents, my dad's parents and my mom's parents lived in the same area, okay. and it was over by the Orange YMCA BMX track. But I didn't know what that was. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had they had the lights on all the time, and I wondered what that was. And when my cousin got her driver's license, I'm like, hey, will you drive me over there? I'm just curious what that is. Just because you saw the lights. Yeah, just because yeah. I saw the lights. <laughs> and you you know see it from the freeway or whatever. And when we rolled up to the parking lot and we went and I saw the track for the first time, I was like, I mean, it was that moment in my life where I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. That is the coolest thing ever. And I liked riding bikes anyways. I mean, okay. Always as a kid, you know, I never had a new bike, but, um, you know, but we always, my, I would always find a bike, you know, like mm-hmm. I remember uh, when I was like six or seven, my dad bought me this really like my 20 inch, but it had a banana seat on right. it, you know, <laughs> and I would take it down to like the local jumps down, down the street and I would jump with the boys and we had a lot of boys in our neighborhood Okay, and I was kind of like the token son anyways of my family. So, and I remember when my sister turned five, she got this brand new cherry red Schwinn and um, I wanted to ride. I mean, I couldn't believe it. My sister gets a brand new bike and I'm the (laughs) oldest. Like, how is that? I was so pissed. Um, But when I was 10, I got my first 10 speed. Okay. And um, then I started riding on the bike path a lot and I kind of got into riding that way. But um, not until the BMX track moment did I really realize that was something I wanted to do. Yeah, just... That doesn't seem like what most girls would be drawn to. 11-year-old, yeah. fifth grader. Yeah. Um, like, was there yeah. was there anything that triggered that? Or just like, no, what's it fun, that's what I want to do. It just so rad. Yeah. And, you know, I was always doing um, team sports, mostly softball. Okay. Um, and my dad played, uh, actually, double-A baseball until he was 40 years old. So okay. every Sunday, we would go to the baseball diamond, and we would, you know drag the field, line it, base it. I would do that every Sunday with my dad okay. until I was basically 12. Yep. Um, but the story is I saw the track, but I told my dad I wanted to race. And he's like, not a chance <laughs> really? are you doing that. Just for safety reasons? Yeah, or, he just yeah. looked like, that's dangerous. You're never going to do that. And so I was just, I thought to myself, how am I going to do that? Yeah. Um, so we had um, four boys on our street. And they all had BMX bikes. Okay. And so one by one, I convinced each one of them to go out to the BMX track and they all started racing. So by the summer of, I'm guessing that, I think that was 82 or 83. I think it was 83. <laughs> it was the summer of 83. They, um, they all were racing. Okay. And uh, every once in a while, uh, one of the dads would let me take the bike around the track. And I just, I loved it. So would you just go hang out with them while they raced? I would just hang out at the BMX races. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't riding. I didn't yep. have a BMX bike. I had a 10 speed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, I mean, I'm sure like even cost wise, I'm sure like my dad, my dad was, my mom was a stay at home parent at the time. And my dad was a truck driver. And it wasn't like we had a plethora of dollars, right. you know? So I think, that could have been some of it, but I think my dad wouldn't even let me play soccer because he was afraid I was going to beat everybody up on the the field. So, (laughs) I mean, I was an aggressive kid. I was aggressive. I'd fight with the boys all the time at school. I was very aggressive. (laughs) Um, but that's just was just, I guess that was the fire burning in me to do something rad. And I just hadn't done anything rad yet. Hmm. Um, so in sixth grade, my dad said that, you know, I wasn't a very good student. He said, if you get straight A's um, the first semester or whatever, then I'll buy you a bike. Really? Yeah. And so I really did work hard. I never did get straight A's. But that October, it was like right at the beginning of October, my grandma was an avid garage sailor. Like she would go every weekend to the garage sale. Yeah. So uh, my Saturdays were spent garage sailing okay. and my Sundays were spent dragging doing and lining and doing the baseball field thing. Like okay. my whole life. So it was this Saturday that my grandma took me to this garage sale and the, huh. this kid was selling his BMX bike. It was a power light and he had a bell open face helmet and it was bitching. Yeah. And, um, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. So I was like, can I use your phone? <laughs> so I'm like on their home phone, dad, I found this bike and it's so sick. It, you know, it's like, it was just so sick. It was blue and yellow and it had Z rims. I don't know if you even remember BMX. Bike I don't, back not in the day. that much. It was so <laughs> rad. It was gorgeous. And, and it wasn't retail. Like, and it was it. used. And yeah. yeah. So I don't even remember what we paid for it. I think the bike was like $75 and the helmet was like 10 bucks, but, um, my dad bought it. Okay. 
And, um, and then I started racing yeah. and I raced kind of like I raced, um, I raced as many times as I could a week. So mm-hmm. it was like three times at orange Y and then so by the, the orange Y scene was, was the kind orange of the Y place, scene right? was definitely the scene. Yep. Sadly, it closed a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. So that was a bit of a bummer. But Grace did her fir- first BMX race the last night they were open. Oh, that's cool. So it kind of came full Heck circle, yeah, right? It was cool. so cool. And she raced in one of my old jerseys. <laughs> and um, it was pretty neat. So, um, but that's where, that's where like the life started for sure. me. And I had... Um, Within like three months, I raced the first uh, ABA national okay. in um, LA, and I got first place. Nice. And I was racing girls like every girl in the gate except for me probably was on a factory team. No and way. I rode. And you smoked them. And I won. <laughs> yeah. And I I um and I rode for a bike shop here locally called Pedal Power. Um, the owner Rob Lynch. He was really avid into it and. Um, he, uh, I remember they had certain levels of the team. They had the A team and the okay. B team and the C team. And so I was on the C team. That was like, you know, I was, okay, a, new, I was a newbie. Yeah. And I remember coming across the finish line and, um, and Rob's like, he gives me this huge hug and he's like, you're on the A team. And I was <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> and I spent the rest of my career racing for pedal power. No way. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I rode like SE bikes. Um, I always rode, um, a PK Ripper. And after that, I rode power light for the first year and they were so good to me. They gave me a frame after that win. Mm. And Rob built me up a bike. So bikes came kind of easy for me. Yeah. I was going to ask, you feel like it just seems like it was supernatural yeah. and you just did it. It did. It yeah. came really easy for me. I just loved it. I think, um, the hardest thing for me, and it's it was kind of not it was kind of the same in my mountain bike career. Sponsorship was less easy, and um, like just kind of the hustle of it all, like that part I of don't it. No, I just maybe I never fit with certain programs. But even in BMX, I mean, I was good. Mm-hmm. I should have been on a factory team. Yep. And um, yeah, like I never got one. And I was, you know, I was a like a mover and a shaker. Like I remember being 12, getting the, you know, typewriter out. And I made mm-hmm. all my, um, my resumes after my, <laughs> you know, whatever, after my first year of racing. Yeah. And I sent it to all like GT and, you know, Redline and, you know, SE and all the, you know, free agent, all these people. I was like, I want to be on a factory team. I should yeah. be on a factory team. And, um, and the one by one, the rejection letters would come. And I was like, mm. wow, like why? And I, and, and it's okay because right. the experiences I had at pedal power were good. And it was my local bike shop and Rob and I, we, we became very good friends and he was so good to me. Like if I'd win a national, if I got first place, he'd give me $25 to go shopping uh, and then cool. he would take me shopping <laughs> and I get new clothes and I love clothes. <laughs> <laughs> But you're, you were winning national level races and the factory teams were, yeah. they weren't responding? No. I wonder why. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I, I don't, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, maybe just always my timing was just not right. Um, but inevitably, I think it was meant to be the way it was. Mm. And it's the same with mountain biking, you know, how certain things didn't go my way. But at the end of the day, those, doors that got shut or whatever they created skill sets in me that I didn't know I had because of those doors being shut okay. so even with BMX it's those were maybe a good thing it didn't happen okay yeah, yeah. so when like how long did you pursue BMX before sliding into the whole mountain bike career so I was it I raced no so I raced BMX until I was almost just 18. Okay. So I raced for six, seven years or whatever, six years. I raced for six years about, a little over six. And, um, you know, BMX was different then. You know, the girls were called powder puffs. And there wasn't a future for girls. You know, okay. like, you know, Elise Post, you know, she's a friend of mine. And I just, I adore her. She's one of the best women BMX racers in the world. And, um, you know, she just she's got a career racing BMX. Mm -hmm. And when she was growing up, that was a possibility Mm. for me. It was more a bit of a joke. Like Like a novelty almost. It would be like, if you still race, if you were a girl and you were still racing at 18 or 19, 
there was a lot of shit talking on you. Mm -hmm. And because I was in the crowd, I was like friends with all the boys. Mm -hmm. You know, I would hear a lot of that growing up. And so that, that it was always my, I I always knew my, my intention would be that I would retire before I was 18 or, you know, leave BMX racing because I didn't want them bagging on me. Mm -hmm. And that really mattered to me. Yeah. So you knew it would just be coming. Oh, I knew. Yeah. I knew there was no future for me in BMX. So, okay. um, and you know, honestly, you know, I mean, I'm pretty old. I'm 46 years old. During 18, when I'm 18 years old, you're looked at like, hey, you're going to go to college and then you're going to get married yep. and you're going to have a family. That's what people did. Right. And I had a boyfriend at 18 or whatever. I met kind of soon after I stopped racing BMX. And, um, <clears throat> he was three years older than me and I really thought I was going to marry him and have just kids settle like, down and do that whole thing. And he was successful already. So mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I'm gonna just marry this guy and have his kids. But you know, he didn't like me as much as I liked him. <laughs> 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 and so that, thank you, Tom, thank you for breaking my heart because, um, that's how, that's how I have this life now. Yeah. And so when, what was the gap between BMX and mountain biking then? Was there so, you had some time off yeah. racing so competitively? Yeah, so I was in school for about two years, college, okay. and um, I had some friends in my neighborhood that uh, they painted, they would do like the color swatches for like Mantis bicycles and mm. Haro, and um, and so they, they introduced me to uh, this guy, Eddie, um, he worked for Mantis, for Richard, mm-hmm. and um, and so Eddie started taking me out on some mountain bike rides, mm-hmm. and... Uh, then um, some friends that I graduated high school with, Alex and John, they also started getting into mountain biking. So they started taking me out to like Santiago Oaks, where actually I ride now all okay. the time. Um, and so, you know, oh, I just, it was like, you're riding uphill and you're doing all this <laughs> pedaling. And it was very hard for me. I didn't really enjoy that. Okay. But every time I came on the downhill, I really loved it. So eventually in May of 1992, Lopes was doing this cross country race up in um, Big Bear, and he's like, "Oh, you should go up and race it." And my okay. friends John and Alex were doing a ra- the race too, so I'm like, and "All did right." Did you know Brian from the BMX oh, yeah, days? Yeah. Okay, Brian sure. and I. Brian <laughs> taught me how to bunny. I mean, jump. And Got it. Brian and I have been friends basically since I started racing BMX. Okay. Our parents are very good friends. Mm. Um, he's like, like he is like a sibling for me. Yeah. We are that close. You know, we're very close. Um, and I really respect Brian a lot and I feel like a lot of my success has come because of Brian's help. Hmm. So I feel I'm very, I'm very grateful for him cool. being in my life. But, um, so I went up and did this cross country race and I'll never forget. They mark your leg, right? You know, they mark your leg, what, what age you are class. And then, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> so I just remember climbing up the first hill and all these very large women were passing me that were in my class. Hmm. And I was going like, oh my God, I suck so bad. <laughs> and and I hated it. And it yeah. was miserable. And I just like, like, am I really like that bad of a bike rider? And I and after that race, I was like, I'm never racing mountain bikes. Okay. And they didn't have downhill yet, right? Like downhill. Well, they did specific. have downhill, but I didn't know anything about it. Okay. I didn't like, I that, wasn't it wasn't event. like they I, I was following mm-hmm. magazines or I knew who I didn't even know like Cully was racing mountain bikes okay. or John Tomac or these are people I knew. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know those people were racing mountain bikes. I wasn't that into it. Okay. Um so then uh probably like just about a month later. Um, Colleen, um, she's the, my neighbor who lived in my street. She's like, Oh my gosh. Okay. So the mammoth nationals coming up this mountain bike race and you should go. And I'm like, first of all, I'm riding this muddy Fox piece of crap mountain bike. (laughs) And I'm, and I, and I, I can't even afford to get it tuned up. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. like, I, and she's like, Oh, well, Haro said, they'll give you a bike. I've already talked to them. They'll give you a bike and they'll give you housing. If you just show up, I'm like, Haro, like, I don't even know anybody there. Yeah. Why would they do that? Well, those guys know you from BMX. And so they said they'll hook you up if you want to hmm. go try mountain biking. And that was Brad Lusky and um, Dean Bradley. Okay. So I didn't know those guys, mm-hmm. but they knew me. And so I got lucky. And um, sure enough, man, I show up. Um, I have a bike. Um, they give me housing. They give me the master bedroom. <laughs> I'm staying there with all their athletes. Yeah. Don't know anybody. And you um, get the biggest room? <laughs> I get the biggest room. My sister came. She came up with me. Um, 
And they probably thought she was really cute, you know, because my sister is really cute. <laughs> and um, and so anyways, we just, it was, it was so fun. And I remember when I went and signed up, they're like, oh, what class are you? And I'm like, well, I mean, I've never raced before. Mm-hmm. I knew I was racing downhill at that point because okay. somebody had told me about downhill. Got it. I didn't know what dual slalom was. But when I got there... Um, somebody said, oh, you should race dual slalom. And I was like, okay, cool. So when I signed up, I'm like, well, I mean, I'm a really good, I'm a good bike rider. So I'm going to sign up as expert. Like, so, well, that year experts and pros were combined. Okay. So I show up, um, you know, I do a couple of runs. I have no suspension. I'm riding this Haro bike, you know, rigid everything. And the day before the race, Manitou's like, oh, we'll give you a suspension fork to ride. I'm like, who am I? Right. But I'm hanging out in like the Tomac <laughs> pit and Cully's like, yeah, Lee Donovan, she's awesome. And, um, so I had like people championing me. Right. Yeah. And you know, I know none of this because in BMX, I don't feel like I really ever had that. Mm. So now all of a sudden people are like wanting to give me free stuff all the time. And I'm like, this is so weird. Mm. Um, and, uh, so I do, I, I show up to do the race and, um, my was it, was it the kamikaze? Kamikaze. Was, okay. Super gnarly. Not my <laughs> yeah, thing know, whatsoever. Right? <laughs> I mean, not at all. And, um, you know, I look like a writer does today, but I looked like a freak then, right? I had my underliner and then I had my, my baggy shorts. I had, you know, just a regular t-shirt, uh, vans, tennis shoes, flat pedals. Everybody's like clip toe clips and everybody's just, I mean, everybody looked like pros. Yeah. And then there was me, the super <laughs> nerd, like looking, I felt so uncomfortable. Um, and I don't even know what I got in that race. I think I got like, I crashed really hard in the race. I know that because the suspension just kept bottoming out, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I knew nothing about that kind of stuff and who did. Right. Yep. Um, but in the slalom, I got third place. I beat out Missy Giovi. Woo. And, um, and that was a big deal. Now I had no clue who she was. Yep. I had no clue who anybody was except for Dave Cullen and John Tomac. Okay. So, um, but afterwards people, and I, afterwards it was more that I won the 50 bucks. Like I was like, Oh my God, I have to spend a whole day at Marie calendar serving assholes. <laughs> and I just won $50. Like that is cool. <laughs> I think I could do more of this. Yeah. And I will say that was part of, I love the feeling and it had been so long since I had had that kind of feeling. Mm. Um, and I guess I didn't realize how much I yearned for that energy. Um, and I was hooked. Hmm. That was, that was my moment. Yeah. And now you've got, it sounds like support crew people have you and yeah. And then, um, and then Haro invited me to go to the national champs in Durango and they flew me out there and gave me housing again. And, um, and that race, uh, it was cool. Like the dual slalom had, um, they had like two triples they had two triple sets and none of the girls could jump okay. um i was i'm pretty confident i've been i was the first bmx rider to really girl female to to raise mountain bikes okay i i'm not a hundred percent on that but yeah. i feel pretty confident like i was one of the first got it and um and so i was jumping <clears throat> the jumps no problem you know that kind of stuff was easy for me however it didn't go that good in the race because i crashed but um i think i got fourth and i think i got like ninth in the downhill i crashed mm-hmm. also in yeah. the downhill but it, it for me like the results didn't matter at that point for me it just was i had that feeling back okay so whether i was going to race again or not race it didn't matter for me i think I finally realized that I needed that kind of excitement back in my life. And I was going to choose some type of activity again. Okay. But that's crazy. So you're at that race potentially being like, I may never do this again. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't look at mountain biking like it was a career. Yeah. I looked at it like it was just fun. Okay, cool. I'm going to go back to college next semester. Mm -hmm. And you know, I worked and it wasn't, I wasn't like these, some of these people that were making a living at the time, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I, I was like, I was moving forward with my life. You know, I was going to school to be a social worker. Um, I, I had a great job. I worked for a dentist. Um, I just had things that I, you know, boring life, but it was my life. Right. And I was on track to have this boring life. <laughs> so what, what derailed the boring life to get you to go full time so with I riding bikes? Stick man at Durango. Okay. And, um, we became friends and he, you know, Toby Henderson, I knew Toby mm-hmm. and, um, and Toby was putting together with Rich Vidiello, this, uh, downhill team at Iron Horse. Okay. And, um, and so they wanted to sponsor me. And so 
Uh, they talked to me about it. You know, I knew nothing about contracts. I'd never signed a contract in my life. Yeah. And um, 20 years old, they're negotiating a contract with me. And I'll never forget, it was for no money. <laughs> it was a $3,000 um, <clears throat> max out on uh, uh, bonuses. bonuses. Yeah. So 3000 max. And the fact that I signed that contract, I must have been crazy because mm. you can't live on three thousand dollars <laughs> for seven months or whatever. Yeah. You just can't live on three thousand dollars. And if you can, I mean, wow, you are amazing. Mm. Um, but so I signed that contract, and then I worked all the way up to the beginning of uh, that year, and then I moved to Durango after the first national at Big Bear. Okay, and I won the first national at Big Bear in the dual slalom, and I think I got like I don't know top five in the downhill. Um, for me, it was all about dual slalom. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my thing. I had a lot of fun doing that. The downhill scared the crap out of me. Mm. Um, I didn't really, I, I didn't foresee that being my thing at all. Mm. Um, but I had fun riding. Yeah. So I mostly just rode during my races. I wasn't that fit. Um, so I just did the best I could. Mm -hmm. And um, but slalom was akin to BMX and yeah, just rallying and it was carbon. rad. Like mm -hmm. it was just one of those things. It's like funny. I was you were talking with. Um, <clears throat> Matt uh, Roberts, Robertson? No, wait, what's Matt? Matt Thompson. Matt Thompson. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> Matt Thompson. That was a great interview, by the way. Thanks. And he was talking about how people don't race slalom because they don't want their skills to be seen or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And it was when he said that, I thought, God, is that really why? Because see, I never, I think I, you know, I never had a problem with that. Hmm. So I just loved it so much. I, I mean, when I look back at those videos, I'm like, oh my God, I look horrible. <laughs> I look like such a nerd. But back then I thought I was so rad. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, my focus was dual slalom yep. and, um, and then downhill just became second. Mm -hmm. However, Penny Davidson was my teammate that year, and she was gnarly competitive. I mean, scary competitive. She's 10 years older than me, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, maybe she might be 10 years, like maybe around that. And so she was way more mature, way more experienced, and, um, and she scared the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. But in a way where I wanted to kick her ass. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it drove me to become a better downhiller. And it, it took me some time, but, um, like that year I got a third in the world cup, um, in one of the races in Hunter mountain, I was stood on the podium Gnarly, in a yeah. world cup, uh -huh. my first year. <laughs> and, um, and I just remember, you know, I was so proud of that. And I liked that feeling of, you know, no one thought I could be on the podium at a world cup yeah. and I was on the podium at a world cup. And so that became more of where I was like, maybe I could be good at both. Mm. Nobody's good at both. Maybe I can be good. Maybe I can be that person. And that's how that started. Cool. Did <clears throat> like with Penny or anyone, were you able to train together or just no. kind of learn from her? Or was this just no. totally on your own? Like you're yeah. just going out and figuring it out. I mean, I was fortunate because, you know, I was good friends with a lot of the guys. Yeah. So, and Lopes and I, like I said, I mean, even then Lopes was starting to race more. He was on Mongoose that year. Yep. I think, I think he kind of always was on Mongoose. And, um, and so we'd do runs together. I'd do runs with like Cully or whoever was just out there. Okay. Um, I just became friends with Jimmy Kite and, um, just a lot of people I became friends with. And there wasn't, a, I didn't know a lot of the girls yet, you mm -hmm. know, and the girls at that time, they were, I guess maybe always, but the girls at that time definitely had their clicks. Okay. And, um, you know, if you're new and you don't fit in anyone's click, you don't fit. Right. And that's kind of what happened with me. Like Penny had her click with her, her girls and, you know, like Missy had her click with her girls and I liked everybody, but I never fit into anyone's like circle. That's crazy. Just like when I think about <clears throat> that era of mountain biking and downhill racing, like just think of you so much and to think that you didn't like you at a time where you didn't fit in is pretty nuts to think. Oh, about. I mean, I've yeah. been like that my whole life, yeah. huh. my whole life. I've just been like one of those, that is odd ducks. Really? Yeah. 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 And I feel like I can blend in well, mm -hmm. but after a while it's like, you know, even now as an adult, it's funny when I think about like the people that are still friends with me, mm -hmm. um, I am super good friends with them, Yeah. but I maybe am not like good friends with all their friends. So I'm not part of their scene. Yeah. So I have quite a few friends like Mercedes. She's a great friend of mine, but I'm not like in her whole scene. Got it. So I don't hang out with her that much, even though no matter what, whenever we hang out, it's like yeah. nothing, no time has passed. Sure. We are definitely like <clears throat> best friends, yep. but 
in like the day to day, I don't see her maybe a couple, three times a year. Hmm. And she lives 15 miles from me. Oh, interesting. It's pretty sad. Yeah. Yeah. When, all right. So when did you go from $3,000 a year to something <laughs> a little more so, substantial? So then <clears throat> I was living in Durango and, um, so the season just finished and I get a job right away. Cause I may have no money. I've got like $3,000 <laughs> debt now on my credit card. Sure. And I'm, I, I have an apartment in Durango. I'm sharing it with this guy, Paul Hawk, who's just like hilarious. Um, and, and did and, you go to Durango? Cause that's where mountain yeah. bikers went. I mean, basically. so Durango was the place, yeah. right? You know, anybody that was, was winning what lived in Durango and, um, I thought, you know, I had a friend um, that had a house out there and she said she'd rent me a room. So I moved in with her and her family for about two or three months. And then I realized that, you know, sharing the bathroom with the kids and privacy, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, it's not going to work for me. So then Paul and I got a, uh, Paul was just my friend. Yep. Um, and, uh, and so Paul and I got a apartment in the same complex like Collie lived in and oh, uh, quite man. a few racers yeah. lived in there. So they all lived in the apartments too. So <laughs> it was real fun. world mountain biking. Yeah, it was kind of, it would have, it could have been like that. Yeah. It was cool. And, um, so we did that. Um, we, we were living in the apartment I was totally broke. And so I took this job at Starve and Arvin's. Okay. How hilarious. Right. <laughs> and, um, but I needed to, I needed to work $2 and 11 cents an hour. That's how much they pay you in Colorado. I, and this was back then because you weren't full time. Right. So you couldn't even get minimum wage because you weren't full time. And, uh, and then, you know, you get, get your tips. tips. Yeah. And so then I had to train a whole week. So I made $2 and 11 cents for like 40 hours. And mm. then I finally got put on the floor and my first customer shit you not is a mountain biker. And he asks me for my autograph on his map. No way. Swear to God. Really? He's like, you're Lee Donovan. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. I mean, really? Is this really happening right now? I mean. Was it cool or were you kind of like, oh cool shit, I don't want to be seen? I was more like, sadly enough, I had the exact same thing happen to me after I retired from mountain biking. Mm. And it's really weird. And it's not, I guess because it's happened to me twice. Not that the, it wasn't an autograph thing then, but I'll, I can go back to that. But I think somebody coming into your place of work and you're serving them and they are asking you for your autograph. Mm -hmm. It made me very uncomfortable, Okay, you yeah. know, cause like here I am here to serve you and now you're putting me up on this pedestal, but I'm really not, I shouldn't, I'm not there. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I, I didn't feel like I was there. Right. I felt like I was like way below him mm -hmm. and I was really uncomfortable and, um, so I think I stayed there for like, I gave notice like that day and I told, uh, and I stayed for like a week until they could replace me. Yeah. Um, and then stick Just, and I, stick, cause you didn't want to have that out. happen again, basically. No, because like, I'm one thing about me is like, when you know me, I'm very open and I'm, I, I, I mean, I probably say stuff about like, I probably share too much information, right? I'm definitely that TMI person, <laughs> but, um, when you don't know me and you're like, no, I haven't allowed you in. I'm sort of private yeah, for sure. and, um, and so I felt like my space was invaded in that moment mm, okay. and I thought, oh my gosh, so I'm this like bike racer who's supposed to be big time pro, you know, I'm winning races. I got second overall in the national championship series and, you know, but I'm not. Mm. And here I'm going to be reminded about that all the time. If okay. these people keep coming into the restaurant, which they would have, yep. I would have seen people that I knew all the time and mm. I knew that. I, I wasn't comfortable with that. Sure. And so we ended up, I ended up four weeks later, I, I left Durango. I, I, I subleased my room out with somebody and I moved back to California. Okay. <clears throat> and then? <laughs> so after the, after moving back to California, um, I just. Were, were you at, in that frame of mind, were you thinking like mountain biking could be a career Definitely. still? Okay. Okay. So then I'm thinking, let's do this mountain bike thing. Okay. Um, you're, you're a mountain biker. You love it. You know, you, you're, I'm friends now with a lot of mountain bikers and I know they're all making salaries, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, I need a salary. Yep. I need to hire a coach. <laughs> Excuse me. I need, I, I need to invest in being better. Okay. I don't know exactly what that means at this point, but I need to invest being better. Got it. Um, so at that point I was going to race for GT bicycles. Um, we had a handshake, Doug Martin and I, and stick was going to work there too. Um, I was very excited. I mean, what an honor, right. To mm -hmm. be on, to be on that team. Actually, 
Was that that year? Yeah, I think it was that year. No, sorry. It wasn't that year. <laughs> that was the next year. So the, this year was Keith Ketterer from uh, Diamondback. Okay. And um, he was the team manager. And Dave Cullinan was there, yep. Susan DiMatteo, Dave yep. Weens, and Gunnar Sjogren, and Darren Henderson. So those were, all those riders were on the team, okay? They're all amazing. And then there's me. <clears throat> so I'm getting put into You're this team. You're coming off second off. It doesn't matter. Okay. Like, they're <clears throat> just, they're like gods in my eyes. And, um, I mean, Cully's world champion and yeah. Dave and Susan, they're like, I mean, they are literal gods. And, um, so I just remember immediately being super stoked. I was on that team, but as the process happened, like doing photo shoots and going out on rides with them and doing all those. And we went to New Zealand for three weeks. I realized I was in way over my head. I mean, I was so nervous. I lost like 18 pounds training. Like I thought I needed to eat right. I, I read the book Eat to Win. I went on this gnarly crash diet. Hmm. And just pressure you put on yourself to feel like you had to. I felt be a like I, I felt like I needed to rise to the occasion. I didn't know how to do it. Okay. So I overtrained. I underate. I did everything wrong. Hmm. Um, but that's what the cross country riders were doing. So I just thought I was supposed to do what they did. However, I didn't have, you know the plethora of years of training they had. I right. never trained. So that experience, um, mm. it ended up being really terrible, actually. They were all so sweet and kind and supportive with me, but I wasn't with Stick. Now Stick and I are dating, um, and uh, Stick's on another team. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like, I felt alone a little bit. And then Cully had a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now Cully's not at the races. Like, at least my downhill partner would have been there. So I'm the sole downhill partner other than Darren, who could come or might might be there or might not be. So he wasn't at all the races. So it was just a really weird time. And my team manager, KK, he was gnarly. And, no, I don't think he realized it at the time, but I was just a kid. Like, yeah. I was just this little kid. And, um... Oh, boy. <laughs> the, the stick man. Stick in so. the house. <laughs> <laughs> We're, I'm finishing up a part, and then I'll get, then we'll pause it. Um, so, so then, um, so I think that it was just a really bad time for me, and I wasn't good at communicating. Yeah. And I just will never forget, um, we were doing this race in Vermont, and uh, the dual slalom. And I mean, like, that's my thing. Like, don't tell me how to race dual slalom. And I was in the gate and, um, and my team manager, KK, looks so he's, I'm in the gate getting ready to start. He's like, hey, are you in the right gear? And I just thought to myself at that moment, if I have to race in a situation like this ever again, I'm never doing this racing thing yeah. because let me do my job. Yeah. Don't, just don't, having don't second be the person the gate. that's, don't be the person that's fucking with my head. That's on my team. Like, okay, I get it when t team riders are fucking with each other, but don't be on my team and fuck with me. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I knew no matter what, I was not going to be on that team the next year, okay. whatever it took. And that was, uh, it ended up being a little bit longer season than I had had hoped for. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, it was tough. <clears throat> okay, and then... So you move into GT from there? No. So then GT, I'm supposed to go to GT. I'm stoked. I handshake with Doug Martin at the 94 Worlds. Um, it's happening. Totally pumped. And then in October, we go in to sign contracts. And Doug's like, hey, we got some good news and some bad news. Oh, and so we're like, okay. And I had already told Stick. I'm like, something's weird. Like, I just, I have a really bad vibe on what's going on. So this is October, like the end of October. Yeah. And, um, you know, everybody's done their deals. I'm going to GT. I mean, the team, the greatest team ever. And Stick's going to be the mechanic, and this is just going to be amazing. And Doug's like, and we're like, okay, well, what's the bad news? I knew right away. And Doug's like, well, we don't have room for Lee, but we have room for you, Stick. And I just thought, really? That's how you're going to do it? You're really going to do it that way. And um, again, I'm 21 years old yeah. or whatever I am. I'm a child. And I don't know. I don't, I'm not like sly. I don't have like some, I don't have extra eggs in my basket. Mm -hmm. I just got this one egg, my dream. Oh my God, to ride for GT. That was like, I mean, from BMX days to, I've landed on top, right? Yeah. And then he crushed everything right at that moment. And that was when I was like, oh my God. I'm not even going to be able to race mountain bikes again. Yeah. And, um, and that was like a real reality check for me going, I don't even know if I want to do this because it's, 
it's it's such a stressful time of the year when you're trying to find a ride. Mm-hmm. And then when you have people that tell you they're going to sponsor you and then they back out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great that you, you know, your budget got cut or whatever, but you told me I had a space somewhere. Right. And you just totally screwed me and you made it sound like it was no big deal. And um, I promised myself right then that I, no matter what, would never allow somebody to do that to me again hmm. and then of course, sadly it did happen to me again <laughs> so so where did you where did you go then so then um stick told him that it's not happening he's not working there and um <laughs> so, so cool. stick totally backed me which is why we've been married for so long now because <laughs> yep. he totally backed me at that moment and i'm like oh my gosh this man like this guy like loves me holy <laughs> moly um and uh we walked out and stick put a call into mongoose That's and so um and then uh told, called brian I was like brian dude you got to call mongoose we got to make this thing happen hmm. and by january um we were all on the ooh. same team together. Nice. But, yeah. Ooh, that's cutting it close. It was pretty eh? gnarly. And, you know, again, <clears throat> I think I've seen both sides of everything, you know, like, you know, Sticks even in marketing, you know, now he's brand manager or whatever. Like, I, I, I see, I've seen many sides. I've owned my own business for a number of years. Um, but people are human beings. And if you have some bad news for them, maybe learn how to give it to them and, um, a little bit um, nicer of a way, yeah. You know, because I mean, I, I mean, I could have been the end of my career. I could have walked away easily from mountain biking. I mean, I wasn't really making very much money. I'd like, a, I think I made twenty grand at um, Diamondback, and you know, plus bonuses, whatever. Um, but I mean, to me, I saw a, like a much bigger career for me somewhere else, like going to college and sure. stuff. So that wasn't very much money to yeah. me. Ugh. <laughs> Lack of sensitivity is rough. Let's, the early days of mountain bike racing. I guess, yeah. And <clears throat> now it's, we'll kind of skip ahead a little bit, and it's up to you if you want to disclose this, but Stick seemed to think that you wouldn't have any problem. But what are some of the heyday years, like in terms of money? Yeah, like he said, yeah. you had some serious crushing going on, it's going from $3,000 a year to some yeah. other stuff. If you want it, you don't yeah, have to. No, I always I'm, feel goofy you know asking what? this, I actually but think I'm super nosy. I am. I am very open about the money because I think writers sh- and I personally think writers should share amongst each other yeah. because I think that's the only way that they can make more money yep. and um, and have an idea of what people make. Yep. I think that the, everybody's like so secretive. Yeah, I get it. You know, if you're making 250000 and somebody's making fifty, and you're on the same team, you know, but... That person's making 250 for a reason. So even though you're maybe maybe only making 50, you could look at it like, shoot, man, if I can rise my game and, you know, become more valuable, I can make 250. Yeah. Don't look at it like, oh, they make way more money than me. Like I'm certain Lopes probably always made more salary than me. Mm-hmm. But he deserved it. He was amazing. And I feel like I became amazing because of somebody like him. Mm-hmm. And because of somebody like him, I gained the confidence to ask for the money. Sure. So like in, um, two in 95, um, uh, Bob Markovicus, he was the president of Mongoose. Um, he, you know, I had nothing. He knew I had nothing. He could have said nothing. He could have said, no, I'm not going to give you any money. But I told Bob straight up, the only way I can do this is if you give me $20,000 salary and you pay for my health insurance. So I think I got 25 grand that year. Okay. And, um, and then he gave me this bonus structure where I could make, um, I want to say like the bonus was 50 grand. I could make up 50 grand bonus. They were good wow. bonuses, yeah. right? And I raced two events. <clears throat> so I have like the opportunity to make pretty good yeah, money. Yeah, to add it up. So right? like, I mean, no problem for me to make like 10 grand in a weekend. Okay. No problem. Um, plus, you know, during those days, money was getting to be better and better at the bike races. So by the end of that year, I win two national championships. I've won a plethora of races. I win the world championships mm-hmm. in downhill and that payout alone was $25,000, but I've already maxed from, out from the UCI. From, no, no, no. Or from, from your Mongoose. bonus. Okay. So I've already maxed <clears throat> out my bonuses a long time ago. <laughs> yep. And, um, Bob still gives me all my bonuses. That's so not sick. only do I make like, uh, I mean, crazy. It was like, I went from being poor. I mean, I thought I was poor, like having credit card debt mm-hmm. at the beginning of that year yep. to, 
buying a brand new car, walked in and paid cash for it. I mean, it was a Honda Accord, but I mean, <laughs> it was still, I bought a brand new car yeah. with cash. I bought a house that year. Hmm. And I mean, my life was like totally different from the year before where I didn't know if, even know if I was going to race yeah. bikes. And, um, and I had money in the bank and I just, my life changed so much. And really because of Bob Markovicus, he was always really um, on us. He's, uh, he's over at Specialized now, but Bob's just, he has done amazing things for our whole industry. A lot of people mm. don't know who he is, but he's just an incredible human for the, the cycling world. And Bob would always be like, put it away. Put the money away. Yeah, it's good. Don't it's gonna... spend it. He was always really adamant about educating us on, um, you know, if you, make, if you make a dollar, at least save a penny. Mm. And um, he just had, he had a lot of wisdom and I think being the president of a company and he invested a lot of time in Brian and I, um, I will always appreciate that. Mm, yeah. And I think because of that, it really, it helped me have a lot of financial success in the futures to come. Okay. So that year I made probably like $120,000. My biggest year I made 383000 That's what I had to claim on my uh, my taxes. Holy crap. What yeah. year was that? That was 98. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was that Mongoose still? Mongoose. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then after that, things changed. <clears throat> the mongoose, that was where I got burned again by mongoose. Okay. Um, mongoose got, got bought out Burnt Brunswick. And... Um, Is that one rolled over into Schwinn then? No. Around that not time? Not yet. Okay. Then, oh, no. Then I, then I started the intense um, team. So, uh, which again, it seemed <laughs> horrible at the time, but... You know, Mongoose at the last hour decides they're going to drop me from their program after they've already committed that they're going to be on the program the next year. And um, and then uh, I have nothing. There's right. nothing. There's not one sponsor that's open. Go okay. Ahead. With that said, okay, it's one thing when you had credit card debt and this hope that maybe you can make a career and you get dropped. But now you have this success and kind yeah. of bankroll, for lack of a better word, just like, you know, financial stability. Yeah. Was, did it still feel the same, even though like you're kind of dropped at the end or were you just like, well, I've, oh, yeah. I've done enough. So. No, because I was so <clears throat> invested in the mongoose brand and I loved, I mean like Don Palermini was our team manager and I loved him mm -hmm. and they were my family, even though they had moved over to Brunswick, Brunswick had a lot of cool people there. Like yep. I really, I thought, you know, we went from just Mongoose to then Bell for a few years. And now we're over at Brunswick. So we've gone through three companies in four years. And um, like, I loved, I loved it when we got bought out by Bell. I loved those guys. And then when we went to Brunswick, I was like a little nervous, but they were cool too. Mm -hmm. And I thought they could do a lot for mountain biking. Mm. So just I just thought their size. Their size. Yep. I mean, they're this massive billion dollar something company, right? So we're working for this mega billion dollar company. And so here's a lot of opportunity. I mean, I'm in the, Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition mm -hmm. for this ad. And they're they're definitely trying to branch the brand out. Okay. I loved that. So they're a good, they're positive. And then I have my own suspicions on what happened. Okay. But um, I just feel like it came down to more like someone in marketing didn't like that I made more money than them. And, you know, they're at a desk job and I'm an athlete. And I, I feel like that happens a lot. I do. I feel like I saw that over my career. And I, you know, I'd like to say to all the people in marketing that uh, you probably have a lot more longevity than an athlete has. Yeah. And do you roll up to work every day scared that you might really hurt yourself? Because that's why I retired. Because mm. I was tired of rolling up to work every day, <laughs> standing on the line, thinking that I might not be walking tomorrow yeah. because I have to put everything out there. <clears throat> that's one of the questions I have is the, when did the risk versus reward not not uh yeah not be there but um okay yeah so that's just super interesting that you know you have this sort of pinnacle of success and then kind of get dropped the same way as like right at the beginning yeah. to some degree and so you started intense you're I started intense, intense yeah. and um, so Jeff um, <clears throat> Steber was, we were already riding intense bikes anyways. Yeah. We were already on M1s and um, Jeff was, uh, he had already kind of had a, like a little team going, but he what didn't have like a real team yet. And I just said, okay, I need a team. So here's how much money I need to ride an intense frame. I mean, I can tell you the details. I asked him for 25,000 mm bucks -hmm. and I told him I'll bring in $75,000 in sponsorships. And so, and they can get 25%, no, 
Yeah, they can get twenty five percent of what I bring in. Okay. So basically, they're and, getting me for free. Sure. And um, so and so you've got kind of the game figured out. You know how to organize I, these and deals. And thank God at Mongoose, we had to do a lot of our own budgeting. Like okay. even though we had team managers and stuff, we would still have budgets. Yep. So I was like pretty. I was. I'm a numbers person anyway, so I was pretty into it. And so I had already laid it out. As soon as I got dropped, it was a Friday. I'll never forget the call from Don Palarmini. Mm. I know he was devastated to have to tell me that. Um, and by Monday, I had a whole game plan. I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew the brands I wanted to ride. So, you know, I called mm. Shimano and Manitou and I called all these people that I knew had already sponsored me or had interest in me. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, like Rock Shock was somebody I'd called, but they didn't have any money. And um, so anyways, like all these brands came on board paying mm. me, paying me money, mm -hmm. but I had them pay Jeff. I didn't have them pay Lee Donovan. So Jeff gets all this money and then Jeff just pays me a salary. Okay. So I set it all up. So now Jeff is building all these relationships with all these sponsors that he's never had because he doesn't do OE or anything. Right, he's just right. a frame manufacturer. Yeah. And so now <clears throat> Jeff is starting to get all these relationships in the industry. That's and, sick. and, um, so, I mean, I like to think that I kind of helped facilitate a lot of that yeah. initial stuff over at Intense because, you know, at the time that they weren't doing that kind of stuff. Um, and then Jen um, became my teammate mm -hmm. and uh, Ira Vick was my teammate and Randy Lawrence. And so the four of us, I got to say, freaking the funnest year. <laughs> I mean, I didn't make nearly what I made the year before. Oh my God, but who gives a crap? Like when Rob was talking about how people like, they weren't that serious. Well, I was super serious, mm. but on the intense team, I had fun. That was out of all my years. That was the only year I really had fun. Huh. And, and we did crazy shit. <laughs> 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 like Randy Lawrence was so fun. And, um, you know, I always and, just remember his quote from headliners. He's like, just a desert rat trying to get through the mud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. He's just, and he really lightened things up and it was really good to be around him. Mm. And, um, we had already gone back because he was like, when he first got into mountain biking, I gave him one of my slalom frames so he could race mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was already kind of friends with those guys anyways, but um, that that solidified our friendship cool. that year for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> and Jen was my first real like close female teammate. Yeah. So before that, I hadn't had a female teammate other than Penny, which and well, and Susan, but the, that was like a different time of my life. But then I'd been racing with the guys and then Jen was my first, like, I would say close female teammate. Yeah. Like, did you feel more camaraderie than kind of like just elbows oh, yeah, out Oh no. yeah, no. And I mean, Jen and I, we were at different like levels of the game. Okay. You know, she was, you know, she was there, like she loved racing, but she didn't, she didn't care as much as I cared. <laughs> okay. Right. Like she just, she was, she wanted to also have fun. Yeah. I wanted to win. Yep. All right. So. I know you roll into Schwinn eventually. I want to talk about when things start to ramp up with, with Anne oh, and all that, yeah, like yeah. that kind of thing. So, okay, well, we're, yeah, okay, okay so we'll take a little step back. So in 95, I get on Mongoose and uh, first thing is I need to get a coach. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about training. Yeah, so I hear you, all these people got coaches. And, yeah, you'd mentioned that. I'm like, I guess I didn't understand that you would have coaches you know, oh yeah back then so <laughs> stick has this friend that he used to because stick used to race on the track mm -hmm. and so his friend jason's like oh i got this coach this latvian coach i'm gonna hook <laughs> i want to i want you to i want you to get introduced to him so stick takes me out to dominguez hills um track and val valentine singleton he um he's there he comes up and jason's there the guy who's introducing us and Jason hands me this envelope and it's got Val's um, resume inside. Mm. And, um, and he says here, you know, it's like a manila envelope or whatever. And he says on the other side of this envelope is what you will be if you work with Val. And I flip it over and it says world champion. Oh, and, um, Crazy enough, I won the world championships that year. So that sounds like spy stuff. I, mean, like, I don't know, like <laughs> really crazy. Hmm. And I, I, I still have that envelope. Like yeah, that cool. was a moment. That moment changed my life because honestly, I don't think I ever thought I could be world champion. That just was not in my thought process. I mean, I raced dual slalom. I was really good at dual slalom. That wasn't in the world championships. Mm -hmm. So downhill was like, I mean, I didn't really foresee myself winning. Yep. So, and you know, girls were fast. I wasn't that fast. So start training with Val. Holy crap. I mean, all I'm doing is road bike training. Yep. Like I'm on the road bike all the time. And um, 
now I'm liking my road bike. And now all of a sudden I've got, now it's like sea and not sea otter because we didn't even race sea otter. Mm-hmm. We always did cactus cup in, yep. um, in, in Arizona. Arizona. So now cactus cut comes up and I am fast. Like, I mean, I'm like top 10 or something in the pro <laughs> cross country. And I mean, I'm just super fast and I'm fit and I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. Mm. And, um, and so I really saw what Val was doing at that point. At that, before that, I didn't really quite know if I was going to be that good. Okay. We didn't have like a ton of local racing at that time. Um, I had done some cross country races and I knew I was getting fit, but that moment I knew I was strong. Okay. And, um, so I went into the season feeling pretty strong. Now this, you know, young girl and Caroline Chasson's racing and you know, we have Missy and we have Giovanna Bonazzi and uh, Regina Stiefel. And I mean, there is a plethora of women that kick ass, yep. you know, Elodie Brown. I mean, there's just so many women. And then there's me, like I'm still, you know, Penny Davidson. She was my teammate. She's still fast, you know, uh, oh my God, Susan DiMatteo. Like there's, <laughs> I mean, Tobias, like there's just so many women. And so I start doing good, like I start winning some downhills Mm. and I'm like, wow, I'm winning races. This is so wild. And, um, it didn't really hit me until, um, I hadn't won any nationals or world cups yet. I had done okay, but I hadn't quite won any of those. That was like local, like little things I had done. I still won like Castaic Lake or something. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal for me. Um, then I get to, uh, this race in Michigan and it's a short track. Like Traverse City. Traverse uh-huh. City, Michigan. Yep. And um, I'll never forget it because I couldn't get through the track. It's like the third time mm-hmm. I'd race there. But I always struggled with the track because it has massive sand section. Okay. And I'd always crash in it. I mean, every year I'd crash in the sand section. And Jimmy Deaton, you remember him, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Jimmy Deaton's watching me go through the sand, sand section. He's not my teammate. He has not have no investment in me. He's all, Donovan, come over here. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, Jimmy Deaton, he's like a big deal. Yeah. And he's like, you know, you're steering with your hands and you need to steer with your shoulders. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you're using your hands. You got to use your shoulders like that. He gives me the full like example of it. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, that's what I'm doing wrong. Oh, that was it. Now I can ride sand. Like I own sand. Like I'm no a, way, I, just a little just feedback. one thing from Jimmy Deaton, and I win the race. And <laughs> and I I think I win by kind of a lot for like a short race, and that was my first win. And from there oh. we went to the finals. So I had had consistent results. Right. I was, but I was third overall in the overall. And we went to Helena, Georgia. And, um, it was basically a cross country race. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing was cross country and Julie Furtado signs up for it. And I'm like, okay, well, who's, who's, (laughs) who's, who's beating Julie Furtado? (laughs) Nobody. So I'm like, no way can I win the overall. I just win the overall for the dual slalom the night before. So I'm national champion. I'm stoked. And sure enough, Elka Brutsar and Kim Sonier, they just choke in the race. (laughs) Totally choke. I end up getting second behind Julie. And I freaking win the national championships. No and I've only won one race. I don't even win the net finals, right? Julie <laughs> yeah. wins it. Freaking, you know, Julie. And, um, and so, and I don't know what happened, but from that moment on, I felt like I was a downhiller. Hmm. It was just that transition for me, those few races. And then I went to the world champs. I had done, um, Val was big into self-hypnosis. Really? Super big into it. So I had already done, he wasn't big into doing it a lot, but Mm -hmm. there's six week blocks. And I had exactly six weeks from the last national, um, to the, um, world champs. How how do you self hypnotize yourself? Is that redundant? (laughs) It's just, it's like a process. So some people would go, Oh, it's like meditation. It's actually not like meditation. Um, but it's similar. There are some similarities, but, um, this is more of um, taking ownership of your body mm-hmm. and almost having like an out of body experience, um, but being able to maintain the focus throughout the whole process. Crazy. And why it takes six weeks is because at the beginning, like I know for me, and I've I've actually shared it with some people over the years. Um, the first three weeks, you have a lot of anxiety doing it. Yeah, and are you it's just distracted? Crazy. Like train yourself to not. And you be have distracted. to do it twice a day. So you do okay. it when you wake up in the morning and then before you go to bed. And, um, and it's, it's a, it's like a legitimate workout for you. Like you incorporate that as part of your training. Hmm. Um, and most people by three weeks, they've given up, so they won't do it. But after three weeks, the next three weeks are where it happens. And, um, and so I did that for the world champs. I was super focused. The first time I did it, it definitely, I, I saw that it worked. I mean, I was so focused when I raced, 
but I was, it was the first time. Mm. The next time when I did it, I better understood the process. And, um, I mean, when I was at world champs, it was just, um, I was in a different zone Mm. and uh, that race was, uh, I mean, and everything that could have gone like everything that I still, I'm still a new rider. I've only raced. This is my third full t- year on the <laughs> circuit, so crazy. and yeah. I still haven't raced a full World Cup se- mm-hmm. season. So even by '95, I've only done a couple World Cups. Maybe I've done five World Cups total in my whole career. Okay. So I'm not like big on the World Cup scene. I know who all these girls are, and I know I'm not probably at that level. Okay. But at this race, for whatever reason, I just I'm going to do my best. And I'm really, I know that I have the ability to do well. Hmm. I mean, when I don't think so, but, um, and sh- I win by nine seconds. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> With, like using the technique, like was, were you kind of nerve free? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so like I'll, so, so out or whatever. I'm a, like you said, OCD. So I, I'm always early. Like if I got to warm up for 35 minutes, I'm there at 40 minutes, setting okay. my wind trainer up, getting my like tape on the bar to, you know, know what, how many wind interval, I mean, uh, intervals I'm doing. And I have, I'm very OCD like that. I'm okay. super organized. But that race, they had 50,000 spectators. It was super insane. So the shuttles were running late. So I didn't even get to the top until like, I think I had like 25 minutes before the race started. And it had poured down rain the night before. So um, I believe, I believe the masters had gone off just right before us. And so we were the next group to go off. So I wanted to run over and look at the first corner because it was like off camber and it was kind of... uh, kind of sketchy so i run over to check it out i have to see the dirt like i just got to know what mm-hmm. my i've got to be prepared mentally and i hit the fence and it's an electric fence and i fully electrocute myself Shut up. swear to god <laughs> no i way. fully fucking electrocute myself <laughs> and i'm just like and i'm totally electrocuted like my whole arm went numb and this is like 25 minutes to go before my race <laughs> and run. you haven't even started your routine oh yet. i haven't even <laughs> warmed up and i'm like oh my god i'm freaking out and so i'm running back and my arm's totally numb no and I'll just never forget, I get my warm-up in. It's like only 20 minutes. It's like a really quick warm-up. I get off the bike, and there's like six girls in front of me to go. And Giovanna Bonazzi, do you know who she is, right? Okay, know. so she's been world champion twice. Okay. She was like 91 and 93 or something. Okay. So she's rolling through, like coming to get in line. Mm-hmm. She comes up to me, and she looks at me, and she's like, you like that bike? And she just <laughs> says this comment to me, like totally playing head games with me. And I just, I just like, I literally thought to myself, what the fuck? Is this like, is, is this like a weird day or something? Yeah. Like what a weird day. And I just remember she totally tried to get in my head, but yeah. I was in such a zone that I was able to laugh about it. Normally I think I would have been affected by out. that, yep. but I just laughed about it. Like, Oh my God, that's so funny. And I, it made me want to kick her ass. Uh-huh. So I was like, thank you. Cause I totally want to kick your ass right now. And I really liked her and totally respected her, but I didn't know her very well. Sure. Um, and I just, uh, I had, I remember that, I, that run was so, I, I so vividly remember the runs really? that I had self-hypnosis before. So when I had done the block of self-hypnosis and I would just do it to set up to win this one race, I didn't care about any of the other races, but I cared about that one race. And so I so vividly remember that run. Hmm. And I remember I almost crashed in this one section. I was way off of my bike. And I mean, I couldn't even believe I saved it. And, um, and I just remembered the run so well. And so I knew when I came across the line, I had had a good run. But I was still waiting for Ann Caroline to come through. Okay. So I'm just waiting and waiting. There was five girls to come. And so Mercedes, she's my, she's my best friend. Mm-hmm. Mercedes gets second. Cool. And um, so that's like, we're excited. Giovanna, she gets third. Yeah. She's the other. And, um, and then Anne never comes. And I'm like, oh, that's so weird. Well, you know, come to find out. Somebody had protested because Anne was too young. And so Anne had to race in the juniors later that mm-hmm. day. And, um, and that was kind of the beginning of, I don't feel like I had a rivalry with Anne. But that was the beginning of when I went to get my uh, rainbow jersey that night, and I was completely booed by all the French people there. And you're oh, talking a hundred French people booing me getting my rainbow jersey. Oh, that's beyond disrespectful. Really made me feel, and I'm very sensitive that way. Um, and because Anne didn't race, and she beat me by two seconds, 
even though I will say Nico also won the junior men's by two seconds over Francois Gachet because their track was dry. Yeah. Our track was not dry. Mm-hmm. And um, so I know I would have beat her. And so to this day, I've never beat her like in the race. <clears throat> and so it kills me because I know I would have beaten her. I know that. But you mean it, regardless, in that, race? in that race, I would have beat her for sure. Okay. But all right. Your hubby stick. He texted yeah, yeah. and he said, <laughs> he said, he thinks that his stat for the week or whatever was that Anne has been beaten straight up four times and you were two of them. Yeah. Well, I mean, Mount St. Anne and he mentioned the other, I, I have it written down in Slovenia, Slovenia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I, and I, her. and I beat her, um, straight up in Vir- Virginia. Yeah. She, I think she was second in Virginia too. I mean, okay. every race I've done with her, she's second. So, but okay. When you say you feel like, were you just talking about this race? This in particular? one race. Well, because okay. I had never raced Anne. Yeah. Maybe I, maybe I'd raced her at one of the races, but I don't remember racing her because you know, the national circuit, U S national circuit, Norba racing, yeah. that was super popular. So people came to us. We didn't have to go to the world cup. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We were like kind of big, ta- big yep. time. And then, so this race put me at another level. Okay. So before this, I was just, you know, American Lee Donovan, you know, nobody really knew who I was, but by winning the world champs, now all of a sudden people want me to come and do photo shoots and interviews and come Mm. to my house and they want to do all these things. That was the shit I didn't like. Like, which is surprising. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know why. Just cause I, I, you know, I saw you in the magazine all the time. So I just figured that's part of what you like to do. Not a space I'm comfortable with. And, um, honestly that was thankfully I had a lot of good things in my life. Like I stayed on mongoose for the next four years or the next three years after that mm-hmm. year. Um, I had stick man in my life. So I had this consistent lopes was my teammate. Um, I was surrounded by a lot of great people. Um, you know, my parents and my sister and I, I was lucky that I had a lot of norm normal life mm. outside of racing. Um, and when I was at races, I was with people I felt comfortable with. Okay. Um, but it, um, that was something I, I knew I had to do because I'm a salesperson, right? Like I'm a mount, I mean, I'm an athlete. Yes, but I'm a salesperson. I'm yeah. here to sell mongoose bicycles or I'm here to sell whatever drivetrain and tires, whatever, whoever I ride for. Right? right. That's my job. And, um, and so I knew I had to do that, but at the same time, I, you know, it's like when you were a kid and you'd put your voice on the answering machine and you would play it back and you hated hearing that. <laughs> totally. That's how I was. I always hated a hearing my voice mm-hmm. and B I, I hate pictures. Like don't take a photo of me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not comfortable in that environment. So like even now it's, I, I hate that I'm this way, but you know, it's like, I was just thinking Michaela Gatto was doing this interview, um, last year at Crankworks, And she's like asking me all these questions about the live, um, the live ride, um, down a line. Yeah. And I was so, I'm so uncomfortable. I don't like a camera. I don't like being interviewed. That's and crazy. it and doesn't I know come what, across. Well, that I'm so glad, yeah. but I, I've always been like that. Like every picture as a kid, I'm always sticking my tongue out. Um, just kind of I, deflecting the I'm, moment a little bit or something. Like I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why I'm that way. I remember my mom would try and take us to modeling classes and um, when we were little and, mm-hmm. you know, we would be absolutely out of control. My mom would be totally embarrassed because of all the faces we'd make for modeling <laughs> and stuff. I, maybe I just, it's hard for me to take myself seriously. Mm-hmm. So I just... I don't know how to become that person. Okay. Like Grace is a great actress. I always envy her. Mm. I'm always like, I wish I could be an actress like you, but <laughs> I just don't have that in me. Uh, that's interesting. <clears throat> so when did, okay, you get booed by the French at world champs and does this kind of start your, your battle with Anne to some degree? I mean, I wouldn't say ever it was really with Anne, but it was more about proving that I was talented Okay. And at that point, And then again, maybe they did me a favor. Maybe had it all gone easy, maybe I would have had, you know, the rainbow jersey the next year and maybe I would have had a disastrous year because I would have thought I was hot shit. Who mm-hmm. knows? But because they, nobody thought really that I earned it or maybe, maybe in my mind, the French were like the shit, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, everybody that was on the French team was great. And um, I mean, Nico and Anne and then Francois Gachet, he was the world champion. You know, the French clearly dominated mountain biking. And the fact that they didn't respect me 
that really bothered me. Mm. I wanted to earn their respect. Yeah. And you think winning the race would, (laughs) would have done that, right? Yeah. I mean, but again, in the circumstances, I understand. And sure. somebody protested her, and that sucks. <clears throat> I wish she would have been in that race. So whoever protested her, you suck because you took that moment away from me. <laughs> <Yep>. You suck. <laughs> but um, I, you have to live with that for the rest of your life. But I, I think it really put a fire in me, and I really started training even harder. So I was still with Val, and Val worked my butt off. Mm. He was my coach the first year and then th- this next year. He was such a great human, and um, uh, he really taught me a lot about getting my mind in the game. Yeah, it sounds um, like it. I'm definitely, you know, like I hear people say a lot of times on your um, podcast, oh, I got ADD or whatever. I think a lot of athletes have a lot of energy, hmm. and so sometimes they don't know where to put their energy, um, and so that's why they do these kind of sports, like hmm. because they're trying to, you know, they have so much energy to release. But with racing, you also have to have a calmness. So you've got to harness it all, you, right? Right. And you have to know when <clears throat> to unleash it. And I think that I didn't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. And under Val's guidance, I learned how to bring it all in and be ready to explode it at the moment it needed to explode. Mm-hmm. And I was very grateful. And in 96... That was definitely my year. Okay. Like, even though I didn't win the World Cup or, you know, I did win some World Cups, um, that was just a year that I better understood my capabilities as a racer. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, by the third World Cup, I, I, we had gone to Bercy and raced the indoor race that year, and it was in France. Um, and, and, um, and I won. I beat Anne. I'm pretty sure I won that race. Mm. Yeah, I did. I won that race. And um, so I wanted to prove that I was better than Anne. I'm yep. not not better because I what nobody's better than Anne. Anne to me is the <laughs> best. I mean, she is she's so incredible. And um, and in in more ways than just a bike racer, I think. And I feel like I don't know her super well, but luckily in my retirement, I've gotten to know her a little bit better. Cool. And I have a lot of respect for her. But um, I think at the time I needed to go to her soil and mm. beat her. Okay. And I did. And so then we showed up to the first few World Cups that year, um, and I got smoked. I got sixth in the first race and sixth in the second race. And they were definitely tough conditions. We broke our bike. No, but, like, people don't know stuff behind the scenes. But, like, we broke our bikes um, in the first at the first World Cup, so we didn't even have bikes. We actually had to have Travis Chipres fly from California to Spain to deliver us frames to race on in the race. <laughs> um, so Stick was building the bikes up the night before the race. Holy crap. Um, and all night. Yeah. Like, it wasn't like, oh, and it wasn't, actually, it wasn't Travis. Yeah, I forget who it was. But he flew all the way out um, to bring us the frames. So, you know, we had had some things going on technically that, you know, and Would, again, this happens a lot. Yeah. But, was that demoralizing though did you kind of just write off the race when that sort of stuff happens or do you think like well if we can get it together yeah I mean I don't know I never I think maybe in 96 because I felt I had something to prove maybe that was more my most serious year um because I really wanted to be considered one of the greats and I wanted to land there on my own I wanted to beat Anne like Mm. that was the goal right like Missy and you know a lot of these other women that um they were rad they weren't that talented. They were rad bike racers. Like Missy, she's rad. She like lets it hang out, but she has no skill. But like Anne, she lets it hang out and she has skill. Mm. So to beat her, that to me was the, that, that was your greatest achievement. Got it. Um, and uh, so when the season started, I had started my self-hypnosis late mm-hmm. because I didn't want to start it off right at the beginning of the season. I The way the season worked, and again, self-hypnosis is like, it's a timing thing. Yep. So I was in the mode of self-hypnosis when the first two races happened. Okay. So by the third race in Mount St. Mm-hmm. Anne, I was finishing up my sixth week. And, um, and I was in a zone. Yeah. Like I could, you know, and, and now at this time, it's the third time I've done it. So I totally know what it feels like. And I'm like, I'm going to win. I'm going to win Mount St. Anne. And um, this is not a track that's suited to a rider like me, a dual <laughs> slalom rider, right? Like that yeah. track is radical. That's the most brutal. And that year they changed the track. So it was even more technical than it had been in the past. Okay. 
um, which kind of didn't suit me because like a long pedaling section, they took it out and, but I didn't care. Like nothing was going to phase me. I was like ready to just win. Hmm. And, um, I remember going up in the chairlift, I mean, in the gondola and I forgot my fucking knee cups. And I just remember like going, Oh my God, you forgot your fucking knee cups. It was super hot out. It's always like, like you, you either get it cold or rainy or humid or whatever. It was super humid and hot, like so humid and hot that I got up to the top and I'm like, I'm not even warming up. I'm not even going to warm up. It's so hot. I'm just going to mm. sit here and I'm just going to go through the course. I'm going to stay calm. Yeah, you forgot your knee cups, you dipshit, but whatever. And you're not going to need your knee cups because you're going to kick ass, I told myself. And um, I just remember I was laying down and I was going through the course with my eyes closed and Kim Sonia comes over and she hits me so fucking hard on the back. Hey, bam, slams me on the back. Uh. I mean, purposefully, you know, again, some riders <clears throat> didn't, I, I wasn't a fan favorite for some of the competitors. And, um, yeah, was it kind of a dick move to oh, just like total, distract you? Okay. Total dick move. She, I was, I mean, my head is down on my handlebars. I'm doing my self hypnosis. Yeah. She comes over. I mean, hits me so hard, <laughs> tells me good luck, which I know she didn't mean. I mean, I love you, Kim and all, but please, you were not nice to me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, and then, sorry, shouldn't have done that because now you just added more fuel. Now I'm just going to slaughter. You. Yeah. Like. Now I'm just going to slaughter. The I know class. it seems like those events I are what get just, you over the. So and I felt like that happened to me so often that and I'm a nice person. Like I champion people all the time. There wasn't I wasn't I wasn't greedy. I only picked a few races a year to win. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't greedy like everybody else was greedy. They wanted to win every race. I only picked a few races a year to win. That was the race I wanted to win. Hmm. And when I rolled into the house, um, the start gate, I just. I felt super like ready hmm. and at first crank, I pulled my fucking foot out of my clip oh. and it was just hilarious. And I just, and I laugh and um, actually I just watched this video. Somebody has it online. Yeah. They have the, they have the 95, whatever. And I, um, I, and I watched it and I was like, that's so funny. Like I remember my foot coming right out of yeah. the battle and didn't even phase me. Yeah. Like I remember it happening. It's like put it back in and put go. it back in. And I just remember hitting all the lines. Like I just remember that race just, and it, and back then a lot of the riders were on disc brakes. So, mm -hmm. but we had V brakes. Okay. So they were pretty bad. <laughs> and I remember I would watch people practice and <clears throat> downhilling is a lot about late breaking. Like people try to pre-break. I watch it all the time. Like now I'm like, a, I mean, I'm an avid fan of downhilling, you know, like these girls that are riding these 800 mil wide handlebars. Sorry, girls, you're freaking stupid if you're riding 800 mil wide handlebars um and I, and I and i so i'm an avid fan of like watching how people ride their bikes okay. and um and it's the late breaking that wins bike races hmm. you got to be a late breaker and um, i mean again in certain conditions you know rainy whatever you've got to be a little bit different but and that's what i learned at that race hmm. and through practice and i just i waited till the last second to break for every single thing yeah and i'd be damned by five seconds <laughs> And I mean, I, you know, watching back at her, she didn't have like a, you could tell like something wasn't right with her and her run, but she beat the next rider by like 14 seconds. Jeez, so you're so up third by 20 place almost? is like, yeah, yeah. So third place is pretty far from us. So, and I think I, I, I know I got, I had a great yeah. men's result, like top 50 or something. That's it sick. was like, it was a good race, Yeah. but more than anything, then I felt like every time I put on the rainbow jersey, I earned it. Hmm. Until that moment at Mount St. Anne, I didn't ever feel comfortable in the rainbow jersey. Huh. And so at that moment, I was cool. And yeah. at that moment, I became a downhiller. And so in 96 at Mount St. Anne, I became a downhill mountain biker. That's crazy. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Like, I'll touch on it briefly, but kind of from there you know, through retirement, what were, what were some highlights or kind of, gosh, you know, um, cause I listened to your podcast a lot. I always listen to, um, kind of what people pull from and, um, you know, Rob and I, we had the same era yeah. a lot. So, um, and of course that's the most recent one I listened to. So, um, I remember mountain biking was just so, it seemed so big to us back in the day. And I think writers probably still feel like that now. Yeah. Um, but we had a lot of races 
And um, the one run race that uh, had started, I think it started in 95. Um, it was the Hawaiian outrigger race. So they would mm. do these races in Hawaii. Kind of took off like a sea otter classic or like, but it was, um, so it was something we would do in like March-ish or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we would show up and it was a stage race. And um, so in 96, we were staying at the Outrigger Hotel in Hawaii and um, on Oahu. And um, Stick and Lopes and I are in the hotel in the lobby or whatever. And here comes these guys, these freaking Palmer and <laughs> um, uh, Colin. And um, no, I don't know if Colin was with those guys yet, but um, Randy. Kurt. I don't think Kurt was with those guys either. I think that kind of Kurt and Colin... Bailey, I think that relationship happened a little bit like after that. Yep. But I just remember Palmer, and, and he wasn't even as tatted as he ended up becoming. But he's tatted and he's pretty gnarly looking. <laughs> I'm super conservative. I'm like a you know super nerd. Lopes, we're like nerds. We're all like nerds. <laughs> and this guy comes in. And he's like, dude, I, I see you guys in the mags, man. And he's like pumped on us he's no a way. fan yeah. of lee donovan and brian lobes and stick man and he knows all about us and he wants to hang out with us so this was in 96 yeah. and that's how Pal- that's how we met palmer hmm. and then um and then we just because he was there to ride bikes though right he wasn't there to ride bikes he just happened so to be did, in a while no no he came there to be at the race okay, but he didn't it. race okay like he's this I don't. I know nothing. I knew nothing about him. Yeah. I wasn't like I didn't really branch too far out of the bike world, um, and uh, but I knew Randy because I'd already given Randy the slalom bike earlier in the year. Yep. I had met Randy, and um, so now Palmer's in the scene, and so you know Palmer brought like a flair, like a Missy flair, yep. right? You know they brought something to the table that made racing exciting, and I'm so grateful for those people to be there during our mm. time and. I was lucky enough that Palmer and I, we were friends and, um, you know, as time happens, you know, things go other ways, you know, but those years were special. Mm. And, um, like that year at worlds, um, I remember we stayed at the same, we all, we, you know, we were very good friends. Like Joe Buckley was his mechanic and Joe Buck was our roommate. Mm -hmm. Um, so Palmer was around a lot and then Kurt started hanging out and those guys would be at my house. And it was funny because I had like all these derelicts around me, you know, (laughs) but, um, and I'm so serious. So I would always be like, I'm the straight edge one. I'm like super serious about my training program. And, you know, I have my massages on Mondays and I have the yoga on Tuesdays and Thursdays. (laughs) I was very regimented. Mm. And then these guys would come around and they'd make me laugh and, you know, they were silly and, um, and it was good. It was good to have that. Cause Lopes was you know, not <clears throat> super serious, but he was definitely in the middle of me and them. Sure. So I didn't have anybody that was kind of crazy like yeah. that. That's cool. That's yeah. super cool. When, when did you kind of decide it was time to wind it down and sort of that, the risk outweigh the reward? Yeah. So, um, it was in, when I worked at, when I had the intense team in 99, by the end of that year, I was, I, I realized that there was no guarantees for me to have a sponsor, mm-hmm. you know, and I had been making good money. Um, and so I kind of, not that I lived like that. I didn't live like that, but I definitely was used to making a good living. Sure. And, and it sounds like you've kind of always been thinking ahead about like what life's going to be. Well, I've just... I never felt like somebody was going to be able to take care of me. So I always knew I'd always have to take care of myself. And even though I've had stick in my life the whole time, you know, stick didn't make the kind of money that I made. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a bike mechanic and, um, you know, when, when we were racing, you know, he did do well for a bike mechanic, but he didn't make the kind of money I made. So I just never, I didn't, I didn't want to not be able to make a good enough living to afford our home or, you know, to go on vacations or whatever. So, um, so at the end of 99, luckily we had a great year. Um, and I had a lot of fun on intense, like Mm -hmm. I said, um, uh, Susan Tobias, uh, she was the team manager at Schwinn. She approached me at the Vermont, um, national and, um, she asked me if I wanted to be on their team. And, um, since I, I, I really had nobody else approach me. Um, I said, yeah, let's, you know, let's put a little deal together and let's see if it works out. She was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, Laura Carter, Eric Carter's wife was the, uh, like the road manager in the Soigneur. Um, Johnny, um, uh, Botima was one of the mechanics. 
No, was Johnny on there? No, Johnny was on Intense. But they ended up hiring Stick to be my mechanic, and Coley was on the team, mm-hmm. and yeah. um, uh, Elka Brutzard, and we just, it was like a, it was definitely like Jeff Lenoski. I was just listening. Yeah, right. I just listened to his podcast. Actually, <laughs> yeah. I know it was old, but Jeff was the teammate. And yeah. so I got on this team. I knew nobody, though. Like, I wasn't good friends with Elka. I wasn't, I didn't really know anybody on the team. But it seemed like a good place for me to go. Toyota was one of the sponsors. Yep. And I was like, this seems seemed like, like a, a good, baller team It back seemed then. like, it did. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, this is a good place. And got on the Law Will um, downhill bike, the straight eight. And the bike was awesome. I mean, I was kind of surprised because the intense, like I loved my bike, but it didn't pedal well. Mm. And the straight eight like was badass. Yeah. It pedaled so good. It was more my style. Okay. And like before I, before the intense, I was on VPP. And, um, so that was when like they first came out with the VPP yeah, bike. The it was Outland actually one. the yeah. Outland, right? Mm-hmm. So that bike really suited my style. And then intense, even though I had plenty of great results on intense, it never really suited my style. Hmm. And then so then when I got on to the the Schwinn, that bike totally suited my style. Okay. And um, and I was like, yeah, this is this is gonna work for me. But in that winter, I took a job um, working for this local florist in my area. Just because I was like, well, do I want to work? Like, I don't even know hmm. if I, it's been a long time since I've had a job. Yeah. Um, you know, like I know this is a job, but it's a different type of job. Can I have a regular job? Like, I don't even know if I could have a regular job. I mean, I have so much freedom as an athlete. I work my ass off, mm-hmm. but I still have freedom and regular jobs. You don't really have freedom. You know, that's my mind, my thinking. Yeah. So can I do that? So I took this job at this flower shop. Just to see if you can have a Just to a see job if again. I could handle a regular job. Like that's showing crazy. up. That's and, like that's like um, the year like here, I kind of know. And here I'm making like, I mean, that year I probably made like $200,000 that year. I know. I was, I was making say, $10 like, an hour working for this woman. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know if I could actually have a regular job. So I thought, okay, you should test it out in the winter to yeah. see. And this was in 99. So... 99's over. I loved working at the flower shop. I had so much fun. Huh. She took me and helped me. I, she taught me how to decorate houses for Christmas. And so um, I just had so much fun. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Phone's <laughs> ringing. Um, I better turn that off. So then. It's the florist. Um, well, it's the florist. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so then got into racing in 2000. And I had my first real major injury. I'd always mm. had like injuries, but my first major injury in my whole racing career was that uh, in Vermont. And um, I just remember it was pretty gnarly. I had ripped the ligaments off of my left ankle. And, um, and so I missed that race. The only, I think it's the only race I've never never raced really like I've that you went to and finished didn't race. a race yeah but that was the only race i've gone to that i've never raced at like i couldn't race the dual solemn or i couldn't race the downhill mm. i had to skip it completely yep. and i just remember then the next weekend was mount saint anne and mount saint anne is like my course mm-hmm. um now <laughs> now it's my course and um and i remember that mount saint anne was the next weekend and so i spent the whole I stayed until like the last minute in Vermont. I worked with the, he had there, Dr. Harry. He was amazing. Hmm. And um, so I spent the whole week doing therapy there. And then we drove up like the day before the race. Like I, I think I did like two practice runs um, for the race. And um, we'd have to qualify and stuff back then. It was different. Um, he taught me how to tape my ankle. And so I taped my ankle and I raced and I got fifth or sixth. I can't remember what. With your right? ankle all busted up? Oh like yeah, it was gnarly. Off? You should no have seen way. how gnarly my ankle was. Oh. It was so gnarly. But I, but I just knew that yeah. after the year before, whatever, I've raced there so many times. Mm-hmm. I knew the course. I was like, I can cruise down and probably yeah. get top 10. And it was all about World Cup points at that time because I was doing well in the World Cup. Okay. And so mm-hmm. then I had a few weeks off and I was able to recover. And then we went to uh, this race in um, Oregon. And it was uh, the Mountain Dew series. I forget what they're called. The Dew something. Huh, I don't know. Yeah, I forget. They were like the Vans uh, cups like or whatever. Triple Crown yeah. kind of thing it or something. It was like a Vans Triple Crown, yep. but it was it, Vans Triple Crown. But it was the Mountain Dew series. I can't remember what okay. it was. But um, so we show up and they have a, it's like a dual track. So you're racing head to head. And um, and at this point now, dual is definitely the, the thing, right? Yep. Nope. The slalom has become... America's still doing slalom, but nobody else is doing oh, yeah, slalom. Everybody's doing dual. dual. 
And um, I hate it. Like, I hate dual. But whatever, I'm going to this event. And so the first jump is like a triple jump. And we're just practicing. And I hit the triple jump. And I, I get so far back that when I land, I hit the back of my seat. Mm-hmm. And I rip it off the rails. I hit it that hard. I rip it off of the rails. Like, and um, I, I crack my pubic bone and tear my groin. Holy shit. Are you right? Oh, it was like so awful. It was so freaking awful. And, oh. and, I, and now I've got to get on an airplane in a week to go to the World Cup in Japan. Okay, now I have a crack. And I remember my friend Sten Kramer, he was my orthopedic at the doctor at the time. He's like, oh my God, like you can't do that. And I'm like, I have to, Sten. Like I'm doing good in the World Cup. I have to go do this race. Yeah. So he taught me how to tape up the groin. And this guy Garrett, who was Jeez. our PT, taught me how to tape up the groin. And I'm like, like barely like limping. Yeah. And, and I think that year was, it was like a real reality. I really just raced downhill. I didn't race the duels mm-hmm. very often. I did a few, I dabbled in them. That wasn't my thing for sure. Um, Katrina Miller, Miller mm-hmm. and Terry Giannis. And they had like their crew of girls that were racing the duel. But like, I already knew I was good at that. I didn't need to prove myself, but I I felt like I want to win a world cup. Mm-hmm. Like I, like I want to continue being proving myself at the world cup downhill level. So go to Japan, freaking have the run of my life <laughs> and I'm all injured and my freaking chain falls off right before the last pedaling section. But the last pedaling uh. section is like a quarter of a mile. Uh, it's no. like so far and you're going up and you're doing all these things. So I, I don't know. I get like sixth place or something. I still do good. Yeah. But regardless, I could have won that race. Like mm-hmm. no problem. My freaking chain came off my MRP. Like when does that happen? That never happens. I was, <laughs> All the time back then. <laughs> yeah, I guess it did. But I had never, I, 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 I had never had that happen. I yeah. had other mechanicals. Right. But, um, <clears throat> and I, and when I look back at my career, you know, I was never going to be like an Anne Caroline Chasson. I wasn't interested in being that good. Hmm. To be perfectly honest, I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be dominating or anything. Um, I just wanted to win the races I wanted to win. Yeah, it sounds that like was you just more how it was. Like I want to win at that race. And, um, and then at the end of the year, I finally was kind of starting to feel like a little bit better. I worked so hard in PT and at the ri- last race in Mammoth, I ripped all the ligaments off of my right ankle Ugh. and I spent the next four months. Is that months... the same one as Vermont? No, opposite. Oh, so now, and I'm already taped up already, like super bad on my left ankle all summer anyways. Yeah. And then, so I, I ripped the ligaments off of my right ankle. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the whole reason why I even was trying so hard was to get Elka Brutzart to win the national championships. I wasn't even doing the race. I didn't even care for me. I wasn't even in mm. the national points at that point. Cause I had already missed a race and, but Elka was my teammate. And I just adored her and she had had this amazing year. And I, if I just could get in a place where I could win and take points away from Missy, then Elka would win the <laughs> overall. And uh, that was my whole goal. Yeah, yeah. And I totally let Elka down and I felt terrible and she oh, didn't ended did. up winning it. And I was, it was awful. And I hurt myself for no reason. And then at that point, yeah. right. But, um, I spent four months in PT going like three days a week. Jeez. Um, I couldn't really walk. I was on crutches for most of the, the at least half of that time. And that was when I said, no, I'm not doing this again. I'm going to finish. I know I'm good still. Mm-hmm. Um, I know if I do the right therapy and I get myself back in shape and um, I do everything right, um, this will be my last season coming mm-hmm. up in 2001. And um, I just knew that there, I did not want to experience that again. Yeah. And in the winter, I set goals for myself. Um, you know, I had I made the announcement. At the mm-hmm. beginning of the year, I said uh, almost a decade. That was my kind of like thing. I made t-shirts. Mm. Um, Lee Donovan's almost a decade because it was like nine. I think I raced for nine full seasons. Okay. Uh, maybe 10. I think it was nine full seasons. Um, and uh, yeah, our buddy Bob Schultz made up the made up the t-shirts. And um, we uh, started off the season. And I just had like this weird frame of mind that I was and I had specific goals. Mm-hmm. I only cared about one thing, and that was winning the dual slalom national championships. Okay. Because I wanted to finish where I started. And mm. so I felt like I was a dual slalom rider, and the dual slalom was going away after 2001. Yeah. Outdoor Life was doing all the network, you know, um, 
uh, coverage. And, um, and I wanted to win that title. And so it was gone. It mm-hmm. would never be around again. Yeah. And I wanted to own that title. That's all I cared about. And by the end of the year, I won that title. I won the <laughs> 2000, I won the um, <clears throat> World Cup dual title. And I got third at the World Championships in the downhill at Vail. Yeah, in Vail. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was such a mm, rad year. A good closure. And like. um, I really was happy. Like, sadly, Schwinn went bankrupt. And, you know, I didn't get $25,000 of my salary. (laughs) And um, so immediately when Mm. I'm standing on the podium, yay, I'm Vail, third place. The next week I was working at Hennessy's um, serving burgers. Literally. Are you serious? I mean, I had money. It wasn't like I didn't have money. But you sound like. But I didn't have income. Right. And so in my mind, I'm like smart, like thinking, okay, my salary's done. Like when we went to Vail. We didn't get compensated for our housing at Vail. Yeah, you know, geez. we had to pay for all that. <clears throat> Schwinn was done. Yeah. So September, October, November, December. I mean, imagine you're not going to get paid for that mm-hmm. when you thought, when you signed your contract before, that you would get paid for that. Right. And, you know, like Jeff Lenoski was on that team. Where right. He was exactly the same. Yep. So a lot of us who made good salaries, Kali, whoever was on the team, you know, all of a sudden now your salary's gone. Right. How do you... How do you continue to get income? Mm-hmm. And like Zap hired me at Mountain Bike and I had a little article there, the Booty Diaries or yep. something, and um, which I, I'm not a writer, so that wasn't my thing. But um, <laughs> It's just so interesting to hear that, though, like the way I perceived how Vail went down and then <laughs> just what's going on in your head. You know, like the, the success of the race was good, but Absolutely. the fact you're just like, well... There goes well, 25 grand. I I'll knew never see. I wasn't going to be a bike racer anymore. <clears throat> yeah. And I had a few industry options that were going to possibly work out. Mm-hmm. So, um, but in the meantime, how do I, how do I continue to have income? Yeah. I don't know how to do that. The only thing I really know how to do is I know how to work at the flower shop mm-hmm. and I know how to waitress yeah. and I know waitressing makes way more money than the flower shop. So while I love Melissa who owns the flower shop and I'm going to work for her when something else comes through because I like doing the flower thing and Mm -hmm. decorating, I I have to make money. So I take this job at Hennessy's and I'm working there and I'm no shitting, kidding you. The first day I'm on the job, once I finally get my colors, I'm out on the patio and this guy I graduate from high school is sitting there and he's like, oh, hey, you know, and he's like clearly successful and he's like a baller and I'm a baller too, but you know, I'm serving him. Yeah. yeah. And oh my God, I'm like, I'm like, I'm a loser. I'm like sitting here serving this guy. Here I was just standing on the podium, third in the world. I yeah. want, like I've had this successful, I own a home. I have like, I have money in the bank. I have all these things going for me. But I, I felt like none of that mattered. That's like crazy. I was, I like, like he looked at me like I went from high school to be, and, and I'm not saying being a server is the worst thing, but I think once you've achieved some type of success in your life to go back and serve people food, it's almost degrading hmm. because people are rude yeah. and they treat you as such. Like they treat you that you're below you. Hmm. And I will say I am a great tipper and <laughs> I am so kind to every person who serves me because of that reason, because I don't just... I think that you're a loser when you're mm. serving me. I think that you're doing whatever you need to do to make good money. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's super interesting. And yeah, just the fact that you went and tested out having a job to see if you could do it. Well, and- the thing was, was that I, with racing, like downhill was scary. You know, and um, and it still is. Like when I watch these riders, people have no clue. I love yeah, but, it. I love what I hear. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just think that's the thing is like so many athletes don't think that way. They just think like I'm crushing it. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. Oh, and well. you have the just, I don't well, know, the presence of mind to not I think that, that way. I think, again, most of the people you're talking about are men. I mean, you're probably not talking to a ton of women. I think women are definitely like, look at Man and Carpenter. She just said, I'm scared. I this is like too much for me. Yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it quits. However, she's writing a shit ton. 
She's doing all these major adventures. She still has bike sponsors. Yeah. She's going to college. She's very intelligent. Um, she's definitely one of my favorites. I'm super <laughs> sad she's not racing. Oh. Um, and uh, But I think women are more inclined to looking a little bit more ahead than men because... Mm -hmm. You know, like even though Elena Caldwell says she doesn't see it as a boys club, it is a boys club. And, you know, everybody's kind of got their backs. Um, and like I work with Liv and I'm so lucky because I work with so many amazing women. But it was not like that during my day. Yeah. Definitely <clears throat> not like that. I know. I, like I have questions about that stuff. Like, do you, <laughs> you know, do you feel like it was, it seems kind of ludicrous to ask it because it seems obvious but like was it way more sexist back then than it is now were there things I, like I, for me personally i never felt like it was sexist but um i, I never really felt like that but i'm like i'm in with that you know okay. it's like i mean i can handle the banter of that stuff but if it got serious, like a guy was like groping me or something, then that might make me uncomfortable. Um, the banter of stuff, that's funny to me. You know, okay. I mean, come on. I hung out with the boys. I mean, you're talking Lopes, Palmer, you know, Stickman. I mean, we would go to strip clubs in Europe and you know, that was what we did. I hung out with the boys, you know. And, um, and so I think that when you're in the scene and you're with a lot of boys, you have a lot of that experience. Okay. However, I'm still female. So when, you know, I spent years developing tires and, you know, durom like what's the durometer and, you know, is this tire working and, you know, all, I mean, I we'd spent years working with Shimano as a skunk rider and developing brakes and shifting, you know, went from air shifting to drum shifting. And <laughs> I mean, things that affected my race results mm -hmm. because of such of testing. And then at the end of it all, when you're like, Hey, so I'm retiring, but I'm going to have more time to develop product or, you know, help you with those things. It was honestly crazy. Like people just were like, Nope, not interested. You're like, you were an athlete and you were valuable then, but now you're not. And, um, and again, I don't even know what I'm good at at this point. I know I'm really good at working at the flower shop and decorating people's houses. Mm -hmm. And now I've become a buyer at the flower shop and I'm helping buy gifts for people. And so I know I'm good at that, but, um, I don't really know what I'm good at with the bike industry, except for, I know I'm really good at developing products. Mm. Like I know for a fact that. I can give you some input on developing product, but no one was interested in hiring me. Cause I, oh, crazy. I just, I, I, it was just, it was interesting and crazy and really made me angry, mm. really created a hate for the bike industry for yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And like, I know you, <clears throat> you know, your career, you ended your racing career. You did the tangerine thing, but, now you're back with I choose bikes and doing yeah. all that was, did you kind of take a break from everything? It yeah. sort of seemed like that when yeah. you're doing Tangerine. So in 2001, I retired, right? Walked away. That was a crazy year because um, we did have 9-11 happen, which I will say was the most beautiful world championships yeah. I attended. Remember, everyone walked in with American flags and um, it was, it really unified our industry mm. at that moment and at that world championships and to leave, leave a space that was so beautiful like that, um, was difficult mm. to know that, you know, I was happy. I didn't have to roll up and be scared every time I went to work. But at the same time, I was leaving this family of mine that, um, I didn't know how life would be after that. Mm. Yeah. And it was scary um, I knew I had stick man, you know, we're married now. We'd been married for like a little over a year or two years or whatever. And, um, I still had my friends, but I, you know, you just don't know how life's going to happen. <laughs> and, um, life didn't happen. Like I thought it would happen. I really thought that I would find an industry job, an industry job, and I would be around because that was my life <laughs> bikes. And, um, nobody was interested in hiring me. That's so crazy. It yeah. was sad. And, you know, and again, I mean, I, I understand, like, what was I good at? Nobody knew what I was good at. So I just said, I just tried to get a job and I got a job at Hanson's Energy. 
and I was their sports marketing person, okay. and we worked Which with Which turned into Monster, basically, right? Same they thing. turned... Yeah. So, funny story. <laughs> this is when I realized I am not a marketing person. <laughs> I was sitting in the room. There was about 20 of us in the room at Hanson's, and um, they brought out the Monster can in three colors, in red and blue and green. And then they had three flavors, red, blue, and green. And... Um, First of all, I thought, I'm looking around, I'm like, this is so fucking tacky. This M thing, oh my God. So gross. And then they're like, okay, what M? You you had to vote. Yeah. And I'm one of these people, like one of these 20 people. You have to vote Deciding on the M on the color. the future of the yes. monster logo. Yes. So not only the monster logo, but the flavor inside the can, okay. right? And uh, and before this, we have Energy and Energade. I don't know if you remember Energade. <laughs> no, Energade was like Gatorade, but like with cocaine in it. <laughs> and it was my favorite drink. I lived oh, on Energade. I was like, oh my God, I love Energade. Just do Energade. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> and, um, and the Energy drink was just like whatever. But that's what I represented. Mm-hmm. I represented the Energy drink at the time. And this monster drink is going to take its place. Okay. And I don't see it. Like, I cannot understand. I don't even get the energy drink, but I definitely don't see the monster yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So we vote on it. I, of course, I vote totally the opposite. I don't <laughs> vote for the green M. I vote for the blue M. Um, I vote for the green flavor. They take the red flavor. Uh. And um, <laughs> and then now it's like huge, right? Yeah. I just laugh when I look back at it. I could have had <laughs> shares. I could have been a millionaire. Oh um, but I was just like, this is not for me. Mm. And so <clears throat> during the process, anyways, didn't matter. Jen and I were already doing tangerine at mm-hmm. the time. So we'd already decided that we were going to do the store. And this was just a process of uh, elimination, right? Some fun. So okay. I think I left. I was at Monster from January through like August or something. And it was cool. Mm-hmm. Like I got to meet really bitching athletes like Chad Reed's first year when he came over mm-hmm. and um, uh, Nikki Hayden when he was at his first year on it, you know, yeah. and um, and these were athletes I got to send product to their homes and be in contact with. And these were these athletes that I got to babysit a little bit. And cool. There was a bunch of mountain bike athletes. Um, and, you know, we were, we were like sponsoring some teams and um, I learned a lot through that process, but I learned that I am not a sports marketing person. Got it. And, um, and I think I always would hear that, Oh, I'm going to go into sports marketing from being a bike racer. And I'm like, well, that is not my thing. <laughs> so through the process, I knew I was going to start this retail store and, um, I knew I needed to make money mm-hmm. and I wasn't going to make money. Well, I could have made money at monster, Who knew? <laughs> but I knew I wasn't going to make money doing sports marketing at energy, but I guess I would have, <laughs> but, um, so I just uh, had this plan of doing this retail store, and um, right after I left Monster or Energy or whatever, um, Hanson's, I uh, started working at Express at the mall in Temecula. We st- we moved out to Temecula from the beach. That's so cool. We went through like a crazy transition in our lives, and Stick was still at, now Stick was still working on the circuit, yep. and he was working for Lopes at GT, yep. so he finally got to GT. After all those <laughs> yeah, years, right. yeah. Stick finally got to GT. <laughs> and so Stick and Lopes, and they have Hyundai, and Hyundai's their big sponsor. Yeah. And it was fun. We'd always have a Hyundai car, and <laughs> I loved it. And um, and so we spent um, – so, so then we moved out there, and um, I started learning about retail. And I already knew I was going to start this business. Mm-hmm. Didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, but I knew for a fact we were doing this store. Hmm. And um, I knew Jen uh, Gabrielli was going to be my partner, and Jeff Steber and Stickman were going to be partners with us too because we're all like one family. Yep. I mean, two families. And, um, and yeah, that's, I think that's where I became a woman. Before hmm. that, I was just a dude. But at Tangerine, I became a woman. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> so let's get into what you're doing with I Choose Bikes then. Because so I, fast forward, we did Tangerine for almost nine years. Was it that long? Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah. And uh, we closed the doors in 2011. Okay. I had my midlife <clears throat> crisis in 2010 when I came back and raced a bunch of races in downhill. Yep. And I got eighth at the World Championships at Mount St. Anne. Um, and uh, why, how, why did I race? Or what? Just how, how did it go? Like in hindsight? Like I know you're, so I'll you're tell a joke. you. I assume you're so joking. So I'll tell you, my but. job was so stressful. I had had a baby, so Grace, you know, I had had this baby. I worked literally 
like 60 to 70 hours a week. Like I was always working. If it's at 12 to two o'clock in the morning doing orders, I was always working. Like if Grace would wake me up, she never slept through the night for the first four years. So I would wake up every single night. And when I'd wake up, I had all this anxiety. Mm. So I would always work. Um, And I was pretty stressed out. Um, I loved what I did. That was the, that was the tough part about it. I mm. loved it. I loved my customers and I love being a buyer and I love being empowered to, to, to make things great and to help people find their style. And I was doing something that was so vastly different than I had done the previous part of my life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I was making a difference. I felt like I was making a difference in our community. Mm. Um, and, and I think that, but I was so unhappy and I wasn't working out. I mean, I maybe rode my bike like five or six times a year. Mm. Like I never rode my mm-hmm. bike. I hardly exercised. I was definitely into yoga. Yoga was definitely my new thing after having Grace. And Grace was born in 2005. And so, um, but I just was like, you know, it's, you know, you're a parent. The juggle is like tough. And I think for a woman, a woman still, no matter even if she makes all the money and does all the work, she still feels this obligation to be available and yeah. be a mom and to do all these things. And I felt the pressure to be like superwoman. Hmm. And um and by <clears throat> two thousand and nine we would go to Whistler every year and go to Crankworks. Yeah. That was like our one thing where we'd still see people. Yeah. And um Jill Kittner, she was always one of my favorites. Definitely like Grace's favorite, favorite, favorite person. And I think in the world, we hardly ever (laughs) see Jill, but she talks about Jill all the time. Like Jill has definitely left an impression on Grace. And Jill was one of the writers that like kind of was coming up Mm -hmm. when I left. And so I kind of helped her, you know, and she would always like talk to me at the beginning and we were good friends. And, um, so 2009, I'm there racing and I'm doing a couple races at Crankworks and one of them's the dual, the giant song. Yep. Um, and I just have so much fun. I think I end up getting like fourth place or whatever. I'm just doing it for fun. Like I freaking don't like hardly ever ride my bike, but I like, I'm good at slalom. So Jill's like, oh my God, you've got to come back and race. <laughs> yeah. It is like so much more fun when you're around. And that made me feel good. You yeah, know, cool. that was really nice that Jill said that to me. And, um, but she planted that seed for mm. me. And I said, God, I kind of miss racing. And I miss that feeling. Like I feel so much like, I feel like, I'm being put into a box every day and I'm being like crammed into it. And I can't find my way out. I'm so lost. And I just, I feel like I need something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. That's not my work. I didn't have any hobbies. I was just a mom and a business owner. Grinding away. And, um, and so I told stick, if I can ride for 20 hours for the next three months, so 20, 20, 20 hours each month, then will you let me race in 2010? <laughs> and at this time, Stick doesn't have a job. Yeah. Sticks hasn't started working for Intense or anything yet. Stick's a stay-at-home dad. Yeah. And he's like, okay. Because he knows it's never going to happen. I've never <laughs> done 20 hours of working out in a month since I've retired. And um, so sure enough, I do it. Mm. I'm totally five hours a week. I'm like, five hours a week. you got to hit five hours a week. And I do it. And I'm like, okay. Here, I, I logged in, you know, 20 hours each month. I'm going to race. And he was totally supportive. He's like, cool. I don't want you to race, but you can. Hmm. So then I raced. And um, and I think that was kind of how I got back, how I realized I missed my bike people. Hmm. And how I'm a pretty good bike rider, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, <laughs> and so, well, pretty, pretty but good. you know what? It's like when you race bikes, um, and I didn't, you know, I did it from when I was 11 till I was 30. So I raced for like basically like, in that scheme of things, I raced for about 17 of those years. And, um, you know, then I spent almost 10 years away from, you know, whatever, eight years, completely really not racing bikes. Mm -hmm. And in those eight years they are very humbling. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody gives a shit if you're a bike racer and you're world champion or like it, not in the retail fashion industry, definitely not in the fashion (laughs) industry. They could give a shit about being a bike racer. (laughs) They want to know how many orders and how many dollars you're spending. And do you have the right high (laughs) heels and the right handbag? You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, Though I was none of those things. Mm. I was just like a regular person that loved fashion and didn't necessarily wear it. But but anyways, that year of 2010, I didn't do a ton of racing, but that year showed me that I just love bicycles. Cool. Which then by the end of that year, I told Jen, I said, 
I want I want out. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have the store anymore. And she was really torn because she still loved it. And I loved it too. Mm-hmm. But I loved health <clears throat> and sanity a lot more. And I didn't feel like I was living. And so I had to make the hard choice. Do we close the store? The store was struggling anyways. It was tough. That was you know, kind re- of the... Retail was tough. Yeah, then. for sure, right? So tough. And, um, and you know, in fashion, it's like in the bike industry, you know, you get like a couple skews a year from the same vendor. So you got the same chains and mm-hmm. you've got the same clothes. We had new skews every single month. And we'd bring in like $100,000 of product. So $200,000 retail every right. single month. You know, we're doing $2 million a year. We're very busy. We have us and then six employees that work for us. We're a very busy store. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and it was great. But there wasn't a lot of health there, especially mental health. Yeah. And I think after racing in 2010, I really realized that I was missing out on bikes. Got it. And so we closed in July, of, well, June of 2011. We were completely done with the business. Okay. <clears throat> So how does I choose bikes get into there and like kind of your, like <laughs> so, your ambassador role, like yeah. you just sort of realize like, so hey. it, I, so I left bikes, I left the store Tangerine in 2011, um, took a couple jobs. I worked for, I helped Troy Lee designs open their retail store in Laguna beach. Cool. And, um, so did that. And, um, but I knew I probably didn't want to work in the retail space. I wasn't. I needed to try something new. So I took a Mm -hmm. job at Interbike and I did, um, I was an account executive, which is basically a salesperson and I sold booth space and marketing pieces. Um, worked with Elena Caldwell there Mm -hmm. and um, she was super intimidating. (laughs) (laughs) She's a good friend of mine now, but at the time I was like really scared of her. Um, she's going to laugh when she hears this, but yeah, she's kind of like, she's intense (laughs) and she says it how it is. But, um, I, uh, absolutely hated that job, Hmm. loved all the people I worked with, but sitting in a cubicle under a fluorescent light, doing phone calls all day long was not my kind of job. Like I went from retail, which was so social and constantly moving to sitting in a desk for almost two years. But one of the gifts that came from that job, well, two of the gifts, one of the gifts was that I got in a reintroduced to a lot of people in the industry. Hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I remember you. Oh my God, it's been like 10 years yeah. since I talked to you. <laughs> How are you? How are your kids? You know, oh my God, my, your kids in college. You know, it was like, you know, I had not kept in touch with anybody. Yeah. That was the sad part. Like I realized that I didn't have time to keep in touch with people. So I had lost touch with all these people that really had impact in my life. Hmm. So, but that was great. I reconnected with a lot of people. And the other thing was, is that my boss, M, Andrea, she couldn't make a retreat, this uh, manager retreat or executive retreat that she was supposed to go on. And um, so she asked me to fill in. It was a mountain bike retreat with all these executives in the bike industry. And Elisa Walk, who was at Giant at the time, and Sally McCoy, who was at um, Camelback. And um, oh my God, there was a plethora of amazing women there. And then there was me. <laughs> I show up on this little account executives and they're like marketing managers or like big time, you know, GM, CEOs. And, um, but they didn't know how to ride mountain bikes very well. Hmm. So I gave a little class on how to ride mountain bikes and they told just me. Just impromptu or did someone impromptu. set it up? Okay. No, yeah. not set up. Like you could tell they were struggling. Most of them like, had hey. no idea who I was. Yep. I mean, most of them. I would say there was like Jill um, Hamilton, who, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Jill Hamilton. She was there. um, So Jill knew who I was and um, like Dorothy uh, Pacheco. um, She knew who I was. There was a few people that knew who I was, but most of these women had no clue who I was. And and that was fine. I was so used to that in my regular life that, um, is he okay? Here, Ace, don't don't jack it up, Ace. You're going to jack it up. No, we're good. Okay. Um, So, and I was so used. No, that's okay. I was so used to that. Sorry, I'm moving Ace. (laughs) My dog is trying to get attention right now. (laughs) He loves me. Um, So I was so used to that. Like, you know, I was so way past being a bike racer. Mm -hmm. That was just not who I was anymore. So 
it was okay. I was used to that. But these women couldn't ride mountain bikes very well. So I gave a little class. And um, after I gave the little class, they were all, you're really good at that. You should do that for a living. And I laughed. I'm like, <laughs> who's going to do that for a living? Teach people how to ride bikes? I mean, that's crazy. But they planted that seed. Mm. And a few months later, we were, you know, Grace was, our lives were crazy at the time. I'm definitely not healthy. And Grace says to me in the car one day, it's clear that I'm not very important because all you and dad do is work all the time. And even on the weekends, we do nothing fun. And I just, and she was totally right. Like she was right. We worked all the time. And how old was she? She was seven. Okay. And I remember Stick was in Europe. He was at some race. He traveled a lot Mm -hmm. then. And, um, And I remember he called me and I just said, Grace just said this to me and I think I should leave my job. I'm not very happy at it. I mean, I made all the money. (laughs) (laughs) Even at Interbike, I made all the money. I'm like, I know I make all the money, but I think I should leave my job. Mm. I'm not happy. Our kid is clearly not feeling important. And why do we have a kid? So I left, um, I left a few months later. I'd given my notice like within a week, but we had been going through the transition of going to Mandalay Bay. And so I didn't want to leave them hanging Mm -hmm. without like the help that they needed. But so I left there in July of 2013 Mm. with the idea that I was going to launch, I choose bikes Mm. and, um, no clue how I was going to do that. Um, no clue how it would affect the industry or if it was really that needed. But I knew a few people and we, I'd already been doing the Rays women's mountain bike events. Yeah, I'd already yeah. been running those for a few years then, by then. Um, and it was clear that people wanted to learn how to ride mountain bikes. Um, but I didn't really think you could make a business out of it. And I mean, if I compare my numbers to like, you know, being a bike racer or owning Tangerine, yeah, I'm not making a living mm-hmm. at it by far, like close to that. But um, I have I have made an impact and I'm making, you know, enough money to... To live yeah and um and the 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 thing is is that i'm available for my child she knows she matters now and i'm available to teach people how to ride bikes and mm. be better on it and safer and um i choose bikes now i'm in my fifth year um i really can't even believe that i'm still doing this after mm. five years and um and if i was <laughs> If I had more time, I would be able to be even more successful at it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, and, you know, we're lucky. Like, our industry, um, a lot of people, like, especially if they're in the bike racing world or they work at companies and they don't know a lot about this um, other side of the industry. And I feel so fortunate that um, there's there's a, men and women. There's a lot of men and women doing education out there. Mm-hmm. And what I've learned through the process of the education is that um, people really don't know how to ride mountain bikes. <laughs> like, I mean, I get people that have been riding for 20 years in my classes mm. and they show up and I'm like, you're a beginner skills rider. And they're like, what? I'm an expert racer. I go, you suck. Like, I mean, I'm pretty nice about it, but I'm not that nice. I sometimes <laughs> like, like, what are some common, common things you see? I see, um, you know, when I first started riding, um, the, the, the terminology was boobs to the bar. I don't know if you ever heard that. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people were being taught boobs to the bar. <clears throat> I've had to completely change that yeah. um, idea. And I've definitely argued with plenty of coaches over that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, just really teaching people that, uh, that they're, everyone's going to kind of have their own style of riding for sure. But most people, when they're learning how to ride, they're not good enough to ride like a World Cup rider. No, so when close. you're trying to emulate an Aaron Gwynn, for instance, or, you know, uh, a, a Tawny Seagraves or, you know, some of Jill Kittner, when you're trying to watch them and ride like them, you're not that good. Mm. You don't understand that these riders have years of experience. And a lot of people teach that way. You know, like I noticed like Brian Lopes and myself, we're very different riders. I'm definitely more of an upright rider. Brian is a much lower rider. Mm -hmm. Always have been like that. Brian's riding style is unsafe for most people, Mm. but he's very strong and he can handle that low riding aerodynamic position. But most riders can't handle that. And so really learning um, how to 
teach people how to ride safely first and then allow them that once you know how to ride safe and you know how to stay on your bike, now you can go off your on your own yeah. without me being liable for you. And you <laughs> can be you can go figure out how to test your limits. Yeah, and develop your own style. Right. right? But if you don't know how to do those things, um, if you're not told how to ride in a more upright, safe, middle, you know, balanced position then how do you ever find that when you're tired? Mm. And so my whole thing is that I'm going to teach you how to ride safely. And yeah, are you going to be a World Cup downhill racer winning races? Not in that style. But when you're ready to get to that position, you'll have figured it out by then. Yeah. But you can't start being a World Cup rider. You have to start as a beginner. Yeah. And that's beginner skills. You got to learn how to do a wheel lift and, you know, move on the bike and all. You learn how to shift without looking at your shifter. And, you know, how do you turn your seat dropper on or lock your suspension out without ever looking at it? Yeah. You have to feel your bike. I, I saw on your site, you have the, <laughs> the Aristotle quote that says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So is that true? You're teaching the habits from Absolutely. the get-go, right? You have to teach the habits. And I will say that, I wish I would have had somebody like me teaching me back in the day because of so many errors that I made as a bike racer. I remember when I, in 2011, yeah, 2011, I went on this, um, I went down to Mexico with Lopes. He did this like Lopes bicicleta, like training camp or something like down there. And I, I joined him to go down there and we went down there for like eight days and it was so rad. Oh my God. <laughs> Drank so many freaking margaritas. It was amazing <laughs> and had lobster. It was amazing. But, um, but the thing was, I remember Lopes was going into this corner and he was teaching people how to ride ruts. Okay. Now at this point I'm retired 10 years. Um, I've already had a racing career. Yeah. And I learned how to fucking ride ruts for the first time from Ugh. Lopes in 2011. Yeah. And I just thought, wow, like there is, there's something to being taught from someone with so much experience. So he clearly didn't know how to ride ruts in 2001. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So by the time when I retired, yeah. neither one of us knew how to ride ruts, but within those next 10 years, he knew how to ride ruts yeah. and how to explain it. And, um, and so I, I try to like, like when I watch videos of people writing, um, I'm very meticulous on the breakdown of what they're doing. Mm. So, you know, it's like, it's fun for me. Like yeah. to, I, I see a lot of things that I don't think regular people see. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate my new position. Like yeah. I'm not a racer anymore. And I'm a coach and, I, the, and the instructor. And I think it's good that you're getting people to have fun on bikes safely so they keep riding bikes and don't just ditch it in the first turn and never want to ride a bike again. oh and that's you know what it's so funny so when i worked at interbike i used to get my hair done at this uh salon in san juan capistrano and i remember this is before i started i choose bikes i remember sitting in the chair next to this woman <laughs> and this woman talking about her horrible experience at mammoth she went there and she hired a mountain bike instructor or whatever and they took her out and she's like I mean, the hor horror she talks about I'm sure. telling this other hairdresser who's never mountain biked. I mean, they don't know I'm a mountain biker. Right. I'm just sitting there listening. <laughs> I'm like, how ironic is this? I'm not a mountain bike instructor um, at that time. And, um, and listening to her experience, how she'll never ride mountain bikes again. Mountain bikes are so dangerous. And just the, the, the pure hate mm. she had, she had for mountain bikes telling this other person and then, you know, I'm hearing it and my hairdresser's hearing it and, you know, no one knows I'm a mountain biker, but I just thought I want to change that. Yeah, for sure. And I'm so grateful. I feel like I, I feel like granted we're still a long ways away from that on the education side. Like, um, you know, there's, uh, there's platforms out there where we can do certification programs and, um. You know, it's uh, like I work with a certification program called PMBIA and um, Shams has his ICP or something. And um, there's a few, there's mm -hmm. just a few out there, but they're very different and um, not very different, but they're different. And I think what we need to do is we need to come to a platform that's really about being safe mm. purely. Yeah. That's where the education needs to start. These World Cup writers and stuff, they're, 
they might need coaches, you know, um, like Katrina Strand. She has this like training facility up in um, Whistler. And, you know, again, I'm kind of like a little bit of a fan of like a lot of people. So <laughs> I know when people meet me or they see me, they probably don't think that. But I follow a lot of people on Instagram awesome. and I'm, I'm, I love to see what people are doing. And, you know, I was just, uh, you know, she trained, she trains quite a few pretty badass people. Yeah. And, um, and so I was just looking at seeing what she's doing and, um, I think that uh, th- that's a different thing. Mm-hmm. That's a different avenue. And I sometimes think people think that's what I do. People are like, oh, you're a world champion downhiller. You, you're like, you're gnarly. I'm like, no, that's not what I do. Mm. I don't teach people to be rad World Cup riders. I don't claim to be a rad World Cup rider anymore. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good downhiller. You know, I, I can jump. I can do those sort of things. But that's not the goal of my business. Mm. My business is to get more people on bikes, not racers. Racers, you've got, you've got a whole other world. Like you got Red Bull and all these people backing you, doing training, and that's bitching. Mm-hmm. But people buying bikes, we still need people to buy bikes. Yeah. And if we don't teach people how to ride them safely, they're not going to stick around. Yep. So that's my goal. My goal is to get people to stick around mm. and buy the five hundred dollar bike, and then the and then the fifteen hundred dollar bike, and then the twenty seven hundred dollar bike. And yeah. my goal is to get people the longevity of those people, and so we can grow the industry and create more job opportunities for all these bitchin' racers that are going to retire, and we want to keep them in our industry. Because I'll tell you, these riders they have a lot to contribute. And I know me as a writer, I had a lot to contribute and the industry fucked up by not bringing me in. Hmm. And you know, it's okay because I'm back. But I lost nine, 10 years of being available to this industry where I probably could have made a pretty cool impact. Hmm. Um, so it's like when you look at these writers and you're, you're thinking, oh, they're just bike racers. Well, you know they've done a lot of cool things they're pretty hard workers i mean you know you just don't (laughs) you just don't win bike races by sitting on the couch eating bonbons you know what i'm saying like you work hard you've you you might have a different work ethic you might not be good at sitting in a chair from 8 a.m to 5 p.m but you might have things to contribute to this industry that you that that these people maybe aren't being open to Hmm. so don't look at these athletes as just athletes they have a lot of other ways to contribute to growing our sport cool so we wrap it up where do we where do we find out about what you're doing online <clears throat> social media all those good <laughs> shout outs oh i am not big on social media <laughs> you have an instagram I'm, account I do. right i'm i choose bikes on instagram and i am lee donovan on facebook um and Lee Donovan being capitalized, you can get me there. Um, Lee Donovan regular is my my private account. Got it. Um, uh, so I I will say that's not my thing. <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> I'm not good at uh, talking about myself. Even though I did a pretty good job, I think <laughs> I think I did a pretty good job here. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I'll do my best to post videos when I can and. Um, I just, uh, I know that SRAM and Live and, you know, TLD and all these people would love for me to be better at it. But um, <laughs> I definitely make an impact with the people I work with. Cool. And that those are the people that matter to me. My social media and me personally, it, I don't, I don't, that's not important. Like sharing, you know, what I ate for breakfast, that's not important, <laughs> I don't think. But maybe that is to somebody, but that's not important to me. Got it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for being here. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. (laughs) It's cool to just see how just how the, all the events just kind of took place and unraveled and kind of doors open, doors closed and get you to where we are now. So it's it's cool to see. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for all you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Woo. (laughs) You can come out, stick man. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for tuning in to Vital MTB's The Inside Line podcast. Episodes drop every other Wednesday. Thanks to Jensen USA and Maxis Tires for the support. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Vital MTB.